Welcome everyone to our next plenary and we're very excited to have such excellent speakers with us today. Um, we're very pleased um, for the last sessions that have been underway over the last four days and really great to see you all here in this plenary. Um, just some housekeeping slides. We hope you'll be, you've been keeping in contact with us through our daily digest and um, it's at the bottom of our programme. Um, please also have a look at our Twitter account and follow us at Festival of Public Health. Uh, we also have our Twitter accounts for the Hub and our MPH as well as our open access free online uh, resources. Um, so just to remind you to keep your cameras and um, your um, microphones off. Um, also, we will be having prizes that will be announced for the best oral and poster presentations in the next plenary. For any of the questions, please use the Q&A box. We will be recording this session as well as streaming it live onto YouTube for those participants who weren't able to join us in the actual Zoom session. Um, if there's any changes, uh, please have a look at our program. And if you have any issues, either use the Q&A function or email us at much at Manchester. Thank you very much to Andrew Curran, who um, has kindly agreed to speak to us today, as well as having a very successful special sessions in the programme. And we'd very much like to thank Andrew for his collegiality and also the ability to work with him on a number of projects that we currently have with Professor Marty Van Tongren. And we hope this is the um, middle bit of something beautiful. Thank you, Andrew, over to you. Thanks, Arpana, for that really fantastic introduction. introduction. And yes, let's, let's hope it is the start of something beautiful. Um, I shall now uh, share my screen and hopefully uh, we can make a start. So, yes, thank you very much indeed for inviting me to talk to you today. Uh, as Aparna said, I'm Andrew Curran. I'm Chief Scientific Advisor at the Health and Safety Executive. Um, and what I'm going to do today is talk to you a little bit about the PROTECT National Core Study, uh, what it's telling us and how really it, it, it got started, because I think that's a, a really interesting thing to explore in our understanding of why transmission is so important to be uh, to understand as, as part of the, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. I thought I'd begin with just a bit of a, a personal reflection uh, and take you through some of the things that uh, sort of led to me being asked to, to run the National Core Study on transmission. Um, and as part of that, to share some of my views on the sort of evidence challenges that we've had to face think a little bit about what it is that we need to understand to make our environments COVID secure, with perhaps a focus on some of the knowledge gaps that we're hoping to fill through our PROTECT National Core Study. Then a little bit more detail about some of the things we've, we've discovered through that programme. Uh, and uh, finally, I'll end with just uh, some reflections on where I think uh, we can perhaps do things differently going forward. So. Um, Let's start off with just a little bit of, of reflection uh, around what happened to me, certainly, uh, as the COVID pandemic uh, began. And for me, it started back in January last year um, as one of the chief scientific advisors around government. Uh, I get invited, obviously, to the SAGE meetings. And we had uh, I had my first invite to what was called a pre-SAGE meeting, which was just with chief scientific advisors. Uh, in on the 22nd of January uh, last year. And that was really the first indication that this was something a bit different, that we were gonna have to start planning to do things differently and to uh, work at pace to make sure that we were gathering information that enabled us to deal with the impending crisis. Um, 
the first indication that that uh, we in HSE were going to be required to perhaps do things differently came a bit later in January. And then things started to ratchet up slowly but surely. Um, and that began with a, a call from Chris, Chris Whitty about the nature of our classification of the virus. Um, it's a category three microorganism, which means that it needs certain uh, laboratory conditions to uh, experiment on it. And of course, we were thinking at that stage about the scale of our investigations. So uh, Chris and I worked with the Advisory Committee on Dangerous Pathogens and our own specialist inspectors in this area to make sure that we were able still to provide a healthy and safe work environment while looking at uh, aspects of the testing that could be done at a lower uh, category of microbiological containment. I attended my first SAGE meeting in March um, as it became clearer that the work environment was going to become a particularly important issue for us to think about. And then as things picked up, additional items started to come on board. And one of those was personal protective equipment where HSE was required to act as the market surveillance authority for the UK to make sure that any personal protective equipment coming into the supply chain actually protected the people who were going to wear it, i.e. the healthcare workers. This was a huge undertaking. We were working from seven in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. Uh, myself and, and two colleagues were receiving information from a, a, a specialist technical task force who provided us with information to decide whether that uh, equipment was suitable to come into the supply chain. And over the lifetime of that particular uh, exercise, which ended at the end of June of this year, we'd uh, looked at the efficacy of about two to three billion items of personal protective equipment to make sure that it was protecting the people who needed to wear it. Really important work, very proud of the team. And indeed they've just won the Peter Isaacs Award from the British Occupational Hygiene Society for the efforts that they put into that important work. The next thing I was asked to do was to uh, work with uh, Professor Kath Noakes from the University of Leeds to set up a subgroup of SAGE called the Environment and Modelling Group because it was very clear that our understanding about transmission was not good. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the aspects of the pandemic response where we really did start with a blank piece of paper. And it was important that we started to think how to start getting some stuff written down to enable us to respond appropriately. So the subgroup of SAGE started producing information, which is all available on the SAGE website now. And <clears throat> uh, a couple of months after that, it was decided that we needed very quickly to be gathering uh, some new information and creating some new knowledge. So it was on the 8th of July, 2020, that Patrick Valance gave me a call and asked if I would run a national core study. Uh, these were Patrick, uh, Patrick and Chris Whitty's idea. Um, and I accepted, and hopefully I'll be able to tell you about some of the things that we've done to add to what was that blank piece of paper. But before I do that, I just want to think about some of the challenges we face with evidence when it comes to SARS-CoV-2. Um, a little while ago, I was just trying to think uh, how you might compare our approach to influenza, which has been around obviously for a long time, to, to that of SARS-CoV-2. Not that they're the same, but you know, what, what have we done over time to understand more about influenza? And if you look at the publications, this is just a, a simple printout from Medline. Um, this was a search from 1917 to 2020. And you can see that uh, just by using a, that, that simple search term, I got 134 thousand results, 134,000 uh, uh, published papers uh, over that period from 1917 to 2020. When it came to SARS, obviously there wasn't much before 2020, um, but even in that short period of time, there were nearly 95,000 results. So you can already start to see that the amount of information that we have um, to sift through to understand to quality assure is really significant and that was clearly one of the challenges we had. The consequences for that, well there are some, some benefits of course because it means that you can uh, focus your activities in a very specific area, uh, it means that you can support the response um, by providing the information when people need it um, with the caveats around the uncertainty and therefore it reaches the people who need it very quickly and provides them with accessible outputs so that they can build it into their policy work or their advice, whatever it might be. And as the evidence evolves, you can provide an update to that information. But of course, 
there are downsides as well. And one of the issues, I think, is that you perhaps lose some of the rigor when things are not necessarily going through the peer review process to the same extent that they do normally. Um, there might be some issues there. There's the potential for groupthink. So you can, um, if you're not careful again, uh, end up all thinking about the same stuff in the same way without necessarily having the challenge that you need in those kinds of uh, evidence review processes. It does have an impact on guidance. So as the evidence changes, uh, how quickly do we change the guidance? That's a really important question for regulators uh, and people within government because you need industry and other end users to implement the guidance at pace, but not then change it a few weeks later. And that approach uh, then has impacts on other issues, the sort of day job, as you might call it. So for us in HSE, we still had to investigate workplace accidents and fatalities, unfortunately, and make sure that the uh, wheels were kept on the, the, the train uh, as normal, uh, even though we were still dealing with COVID. So lots of issues there. And of course, like everybody else, we mitigated some of that through using our international networks and real praise actually for the international community's uh, ability to work quickly across significant areas of, of joint concern to come up with some shared solutions. And just a few sort of personal observations from me in relation to um, what I think have been particular challenges when it comes to our work in this space. <clears throat> One is uh, the balance between our view of a modeled, a modeled world versus the real world. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see a couple of uh, pictures. The first one is a food processing plant before they'd made any changes to their uh, work environment. And the bottom one shows how they put in place some COVID secure measures in that particular circumstance, i.e. making the line longer, spreading people out, not having people directly facing each other, etc. So that impact of real world change on the models uh, is something that perhaps we can think about as we move to the presentation. On the evidence side, there's always a balance between uh, evidence, experience and anecdote. And as evidence is emerging, you've got to make sure that that balance is appropriate. And at least you understand the mix between the three areas. Um, if you don't, you could end up making decisions that aren't really based on good evidence. And of course, understanding the differentiation between evidence and policy is really important in this fast moving space. And there is a challenge sometimes for, for scientists, uh, engineers um, uh, to forget that it's our job to provide the evidence and it's the policymakers job to provide policy choices for the decision makers to decide. Uh, the, dis the people who decide are elected to make those decisions um, and it is not our job to make that decision for them. Our job is to provide the evidence. And sometimes those boundaries can be very difficult to manage. And I think there are some examples where that's happened during the course of the pandemic. And of course, the pace, the amount of data, the visibility of everything um, has also been an interesting challenge. Um, I don't think I've ever seen so many scientists um, on the news, on uh, uh, various uh, other sort of uh, political programs. Um, that's great. Uh, but we need to make sure, again, that that's evidence based uh, and and is not seen as uh, scientists making the decisions uh, on behalf of the decision makers. <coughs> this is a, a busy slide, but really it's essentially there to just demonstrate that actually, even though all of that work has been done, there are still some really big questions when it comes to transmission of the virus. Uh, and you can see it relates from everything to the viral load to the dose required, to the success factors for, um, sorry, the, the success factors for environmental survival, outbreaks, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is exactly why the PROTECT study was set up, because those questions will really help us to understand exactly what's going on when it comes to the environment and how transmission will occur uh, within the different environments that we all might encounter during our waking hours. And the model that we have really for the PROTECT study is that in order to really understand transmission, we have to think about three key areas. The first is the uh, environment or the environments in which the virus might be encountered. We'll talk more about that later on. The behaviour of the people who inhabit that environment, what they do, how they do it, what instruction they have, what training they've got, etc. 
the characteristics of the virus itself and what we understand about how it behaves, how much is required to infect someone, where's the infection coming from, nose, throat, wherever. All of those things intersect to enable us to uh, really understand transmission. So we have to be able to uh, explore each of those issues through the PROTECT study. And the context that we use to sort of underpin all of our thinking is that we know there are three main routes of transmission through surfaces, um, mostly through uh, large droplets that have landed on surfaces, uh, airborne, so smaller particles getting into the air and remaining in the air, and through person to person contact. And that's a, a mix of uh, surface, uh, small droplets uh, and larger droplets. So those are the three main routes that we think about. And what we try to do is to think about all of this in the real world, uh, making sure we focus on that real world context, that we're providing information that informs policy and practice, that we're rapid and responsive, and that ultimately at the end of the program, we leave a legacy so that in future, when another pandemic occurs, and it will occur at some point, the people who come after us will not be working from a blank piece of paper like we were. So that's our sort of uh, overall objective. We have a number of themes, which you can see here. Uh, we're interested to understand outbreaks and what goes on there. I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. We're interested in modeling uh, and using the outbreak investigations to inform that modeling, as well as uh, the methods and tools that we uh, generate through theme four. Uh, Apan has mentioned Marty and Marty leads on the sector specific studies. And we have a really important piece of work looking at experimental infection. And I'll talk very briefly about the human uh, volunteer studies that we're not running, but we are part of uh, from a data collection perspective. And then finally, we want to make sure that we understand what actually works uh, in these situations. And you can see that we have uh, a lot of people involved uh, and we're part of a system of national core studies, uh, which are being delivered by uh, universities around the UK. Just a few pictures of the real world of work and you can see different things that people have done to try and uh, reduce transmission. This is a smoking area where people are separated out, obviously making sure that people can't stand close together in uh, washrooms, spacing in canteens. This is a, a fire practice using socially distanced spots on the floor so that people don't have to stand next to each other and providing people with regular updates. Really important so that people understand what's going on. As I said, we've been looking at outbreaks. We've done a lot of very detailed outbreak investigations where we've gone and collected not just information about the workplace. We've also collected blood samples, uh, swab samples, environmental samples, information about the work and associated activities. And one of the th key things that we found is that it's not uh, quite as simple as you might think. And not all areas of the work environment are equal in their ability to transmit the virus. And we find this in lots of different ways. We can look at it by attack rate, and you can see different attack rates as shown in the, the graphic here. We can show different amounts of virus in different parts of factories, uh, more perhaps associated with the work associated areas like canteens, toilets, rest areas, etc. So to think about outbreaks as systems, as opposed to just associated work with work is really important. Because if you don't, you will miss what is actually causing the problem. Another illustration, this is some work we've done where we've identified uh, a whole range of outbreaks uh, around the country and then looked at the denominator information for those specific workplaces to show again that not all manufacturers of food have outbreaks that have the same rate. So they're not all the same, there are different factors. So therefore it is not just the work environment that is causing the problem. And when we look at uh, occupation in more detail, uh, again, it's important for us to make sure that we're providing the best available information so that we can really home in on the things that are actually causing the problems. And uh, we did a, a great piece of work through the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, which reanalyzed some work from the Office of National Statistics to make sure that we were really understanding the impact of work on the information that ONS had, had looked at. And you could see very clearly that um, the information from ONS hadn't been adjusted uh, for some factors, potent potential risk factors, when we did look at those risk factors, the association with work didn't disappear completely for some of the high risk groups, such as taxi drivers, bus drivers, etc. But when you take into account things such as geography, 
uh, deprivation, ethnicity, etc., there was quite a significant drop in the association with work and the consequences that they were suffering. So understanding what is really going on and unpicking some of these outbreaks in ex extreme detail is really important so that we can intervene effectively. And that's shown, uh, sorry, these haven't uh, projected very well, but this is some work we're doing on areas of enduring prevalence. And we can see uh, a sort of a crescent shape. Uh, you can see it very easily now in the Delta uh, information around the Northwest, stretching over to Yorkshire and the Humber and coming down to the East Midlands, where prevalence is staying high uh, and has stayed high right from the start of the pandemic to the current day, unlike other parts of the country. So the key question is why? Why is that? It's not just about one factor or a single uh, sort of mix of factors. It may vary actually as a consequence of very specific local issues and local economic practices. And that's something that we're now exploring in detail through the PROTECT study, working closely with uh, local and uh, regional directors of public health. I said I'd very men briefly mentioned the uh, human volunteer studies and uh, this work is uh, going extremely well uh, here. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, the team leading this work are doing infection studies uh, with human volunteers, healthy human volunteers, inoculated uh, through the nose with the virus and monitored over 14 days to make sure they're okay. What we're going in is taking samples from those uh, individuals uh, looking to see if we can characterize the virus, measure it in the air, measure it on surfaces to give us some real answers in a controlled way to some of those questions I mentioned earlier on. And we can see that the experiments are working well. You're getting an attack rate of about 60%. So that information is currently flowing through both into our models and into our thinking when it comes to what you need to do to mitigate. Okay, just uh, coming up to the, the last section now and thinking about how all of that helps us when we're thinking about how to deliver a COVID secure environment. Uh, and one of the things that we have, which I think really does help us here is actually the Health and Safety at Work Act, which is based on the principles of risk assessment. And of course, one of the key things that you need to do to assess COVID security is a risk assessment. And if you use the hierarchy of control for each activity and each route of exposure, air, surface, person to person, you will come up with a suite of control measures that are specific for the work environment that you are interested in, the workers who inhabit that work environment, and that will help provide you with strength in depth when it comes to uh, reducing the risk from your work to the individuals who are in it. And of course, it's really important as part of that that you choose the right controls. And this is some work that our CFD modelers have been doing uh, in collaboration with experimentalists as well. And this is a, a model of a, of a human having a cough. And you can see uh, different sized particles, the red particles, the orange particles, the heavier particles. Uh, and as you get to the lighter blue, the light blue ones are the very small particles. You can see that very quickly, the uh, heavier particle, particles start to deposit on surfaces, smaller particles start to move around the air. And within five minutes, you've got a very mixed environment uh, where uh, you've got small particles and large particles at play. Therefore, uh, we were asked the question, what good are screens in that situation? Well, what screens do provide you with is uh, an instant control against the large particles that might be produced from that cough but they do not provide you with long lasting protection from airborne particles. So therefore, when you're going through the process of deciding what to use, if you need to protect people from close contact activities that might involve coughing, a screen will work. If you're looking at a screen to protect people from small particles that might remain in the air, it will not work. So understanding what the issue is and what will work in the control situation is really important. Finally, just to finish, um, testing control options is something that we've been looking at more recently. And uh, one of my colleagues, Nick Warren, has developed an agent based model, which essentially allows you to create a population of people and you can then do things to that population of people. You can give each person within the model a set of characteristics. And here Nick's used an age profile that's based on the UK age profile. You can see that in the top right graphic. They're vaccinated um, to 51%, which was the position on the 4th of July. Um, and uh, then we can see what happens. So this is without any uh, uh, 
mitigations at all, uh, no vaccination in this particular case. And you can see this is the R number for the workplace, quite a high, high R number. But then when you start to do things, in this case, uh, LFDs twice weekly, you start to reduce the R. So with twice weekly LFD testing, you can reduce the R to just above one. If you increase the ventilation as well, you will reduce it below one. Probably still get outbreaks, but uh, you've made an impact. If you then reduce occupancy as well, you can get down to an R value that probably would mean you wouldn't have outbreaks in your particular work environment. If you then look at that with the uh, vaccine, you can see that with no other mitigations other than vaccination, you've reduced the R quite considerably. Add in twice weekly testing, you reduce it again. And in this case, if you increase ventilation, you'll bring it down quite quickly. So this tool will give us the uh, opportunity to test how things might work in various scenarios so that we can then provide uh, good advice to policymakers as to how to manage with emerging situations. I'll finish with this quote um, because uh, it's all very well me saying all of this, but this was some work that Manchester University did for us on our Keeping the UK Building Safely programme, where one of the uh, people that we interviewed said, although that COVID has changed the world, it's not changed the contract on this job. And I think it makes the point that actually to have the biggest impact possible, we need to have a whole systems impact, not just an individual impact on a particular person within a particular workplace. Our Protect study is now producing information and you can see we put something out on Monday uh, when uh, uh, the UK uh, went through stage four, just to enable people to maybe think about some of the things they could do to protect them from others and others from themselves. And all of this information is available on our website, which you can see on the right hand side there. So in conclusion then, I think PROTECT is now providing evidence to support the UK's response, continuing response to the pandemic. We take a real world approach. We want to deliver simple practical solutions. Delivering that in an interdisciplinary way is critical and we have to deliver at pace in an ever changing situation. But transmission, the understanding transmi transmission mechanisms remains quite a significant gap, which PROTECT is helping to fill. Far too many people for me to mention here, but you can see the size and scale of the work that we're doing here. We have a number of theme leads. We have a lot of organizations involved, but most importantly, we have a research and portfolio management community of some 100 plus souls who are working extremely hard to provide this information at pace. So I'd like to thank them uh, and uh, also to thank you and the International Festival for inviting me to deliver this presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, Andrew. It's always so enlightening to hear you speak. And um, we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one of the first ones um, was about uh, the necessity of um, smaller workplaces to implement a suite of controls. And the second question um, is about linking up and international cooperation. So thinking about those policies and studies considered elsewhere. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Apani. Yeah, it's a really great question about small to medium-sized enterprises. Of course, the vast majority of workplaces in the UK fall into that category. I think one of the things that, that we're very keen to uh, impress on people is that it's not rocket science to create a COVID secure environment. The key thing is that you take the time to think and you think with the people who are involved in doing the work. That's the fundamental basis of any risk assessment and a good conversation about what it is you do, uh, particularly involving the people who actually do it, is the best way to work through how you can control those exposures through the three main routes, air, person to person and surface in your particular circumstances. And uh, as I've said, the sort of modeling approaches that, that we're using can be helpful in working out what mix of things are gonna work best in your particular circumstance. You may have a very young workforce, in which case they may not be vaccinated, for example. But I think for me, it's about sitting down, having the conversation, using the hierarchy of control to work out what will uh, be easiest to implement and then uh, getting on with it. It doesn't need to cost a lot of money and it doesn't need to be complicated. Thank you. And then the second question was about the international. So I totally agree. Um, obviously, through the SAGE process, we uh, do have access to very large international networks of scientists. Uh, to give you an example of a firm that worked extremely well from our HSE angle, um, we set up a very 
uh, quick network for PPE at the very start of the pandemic so that we could share information about different types of PPE, uh, different uh, approaches for monitoring PPE, cleaning it, reusing it, etc. And that proved enormously valuable in those early days when things were quite tight when it came to uh, the PPE understanding. That's fantastic. So, Andrew, we've actually got questions on Twitter and our live stream. So um, we'll take those offline if that's OK. Of course, yes. Um, We're very happy to do that. And just wanted to say a huge thanks again um, for um, the ability to take part in this really important research. Um, we in our division and, um, and uh, particularly with Marty, and our teams, we, we're so pleased to be part of such an important initiative that's really going to make a difference. I'm sure it will. Thank you very much indeed, Apana. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And, um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our Mayor, um, who probably needs no introduction, but we first uh, met Andy um, when he was our Minister of Health. Um, when we were doing a lot of work in the urban side of things over the first Marmot report. And um, Andy, you'll be pleased to know we were able to get uh, Dr. Jessica Allen, the Deputy Director um, at IHE to present a very successful meeting as part of the festival on Building Back Fairer and also covering um, another one of your uh, key topics on, on the homeless and um, we here at the university's public health team are really keen to support that and we had our dean who basically it has given us assurance that we can take that work forward as a university and I know you're very um, close to our president um, and so we hope that there's going to be a lot of new um, initiatives that will tackle those difficult questions. Um, so we'd like to say a huge thanks for making time um, in your schedule to come and speak to us. It means so much. Um, we have um, been live streaming on YouTube and we are on Twitter, so I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions for you. Uh, but I'd like to hand over to you, Andy, and just a huge thanks for coming today. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, our partner, and good afternoon, everybody. That was a lovely introduction. I, I really appreciate uh, <clears throat> what you just said. And um, I've been living the theme of the conference. I've just been out for a run, actually. So I'm looking a little bit, uh, <laughs> it's a bit warm out there and it maybe uh, maybe wasn't the, the best I idea to, to, to do it just before, but um, uh, really pleased to be back with you and wonderful to hear about the commitment to work with us uh, ongoing on homelessness. And we're also doing great work with the university on young people's mental health coming out of the pandemic. So yeah, we're really grateful uh, to colleagues at the university for all of the support that you give us. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to come to the big point that I want uh, to make. But first, I just want to, to say that it, it is informed by the kind of two uh, big roles I've had, uh, I guess, that have led to the way I think around public health. First, obviously, a decade ago as health secretary, uh, a much less serious pandemic was on my desk uh, and was dealing with that. But obviously, I learned a lot from that, um, the, the lessons from the 2009 uh, swine flu pandemic, but also, you know, what it is to sort of view a pandemic from that perspective. And then this time, obviously, coming at it from a completely different uh, perspective as mayor of, of Greater Manchester and the challenges that we have faced uh, sometimes working with the government, sometimes having to work around the government, uh, sometimes, obviously, as you've seen, in, in conflict with, with the government. So it's been a, a challenging 18 months for, for everybody. There's no, no, no getting away from that. And there can never be a perfect response. But I, I want to, to share with you all today my kind of main takeaway, if you like, uh, of, of the pandemic, the big learning point. And I think this is a learning point, not just for the UK, but for for countries around the world. What I think we've seen in the last 18 months is a sort of intensified, concentrated version of normal. And what I mean by that is the way we think that we 
improve and protect health by over centralized medicalized interventions you know i think that is often where we kind of go to try and improve health particularly in this country with the structures uh, that we have and we think that that is what needs to be done and it's the whole story so we over rely on those over centralized medicalized interventions and in my view we, we under emphasize the bottom up social uh, interventions which actually in a in a pandemic but also in more normal times arguably have as much impact if not more than the the, the medicalized uh, interventions so <clears throat> i just want to sort of uh, take everybody back 18 18 months and the start of the um the pandemic and actually this isn't a criticism of the world health organization because i, I have huge amounts of respect for them and the people who work uh, for the WHO. Um, and I know at the start of the pandemic, they were giving really clear uh, advice uh, to countries around the world about what needed to be done. I guess it's not so much their advice that I, I would ask them to just to think about, but it was more how it came over in those early stages of the pandemic with that message, test, test, test. Now, I'm not saying that was the wrong thing to say, by the way, but it might have been better if it was test, 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 trace, 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 isolate, 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 or test, trace, isolate, or you're always having those three things up together. Because I think maybe the way that was perceived around the world is that it, this needed to be a pandemic run by those kind of, those very traditional top-down uh, interventions of the kind that I've been, uh, been describing. And if I then sort of translate to what happened here, I think we very much saw that as the sort of a defining approach to the pandemic, uh, scrabbling around at the national level, you know, rather than relying on colleagues in the regions, in localities, which is what they should have done. You know, that early decision not to route testing in, uh, in local and regional structures, but instead to create new centralized structures and to add further complexity outsource privatized structures you know that was a big mistake in my view at the very start of the pandemic but it's a reflection of that thinking that i was talking about that you solve the world through pulling these big levers at the national level uh, big heavy medicalized interventions and the truth of the matter is they are part of um the solution of course they are you can't can't work without a, a, a testing uh, regime. Um, but my reflection on the last 18 months is we have really underemphasized the social elements of the plan. The tracing, which took a long, long time to get right. In fact, you were into early 2021 before it even began to get uh, a, a proper tracing operation. And, and most important of all, the biggest social intervention here, which was isolation. And that has been the poor relation of the um, of the, uh, the, the 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 holy trinity test trace isolate the isolate part absolutely uh, neglected all the way through. I'm very interested in, in hearing what Andrew was saying uh, as I joined. You know, I, I personally think the the emphasis on workplaces where people stayed in work throughout, and there is a debate about whether many of those workplaces should have been open. Uh, throughout, particularly through the first lockdown, and um, even when they were open, whether they had adequate safety measures in place. Again, I received many complaints that they didn't. But what was a gaping hole in the in the response was the, the lack of clear arrangements to support isolation. An isolation policy should have been gripped as kind of firmly as the testing uh, policy at the very uh, beginning there should have been immediate provision in place to support people with no access to sick pay. There should have been clear steps to provide support for employers who had large amounts of staff on uh, zero hours uh, contracts. There needed to be an early message that everyone would be able to isolate without loss of income. And for me, that is a big learning point from this pandemic. If we ever are to find ourselves in this again, you have to immediately support people to do the right thing. And 
we, we, we didn't have that in place and we still don't have that uh, in place. It has been a, a recurrent um, criticism that we have heard all the way through that people just haven't been able uh, to, to self-isolate. We had a, a survey from one of our trade unions, Unison, very early in the pandemic that wasn't actually talking about workers in, in, in general settings. It was talking about workers in social care settings, the social care workforce, care assistants. 80% of them said at the start of the pandemic that they feared they wouldn't be able to self-isolate if ill or if asked to do so. Now, if you cannot protect workers in those settings, then you really have no hope at all of having an adequate uh, isolation policy. And, and then it kind of touches on the cold question of housing. Because obviously the nature of people's work, I believe, has made them more vulnerable to COVID-19, but so has their housing. If you look at the map of the country, and you look at the places where COVID has hit hardest, they are the places that have traditionally, going back decades, even centuries, had the worst uh, housing in this country. The um, point last year when Greater Manchester went under localised restrictions, it was almost a year ago to the day, actually, or just a, a week or so later, in late July 2020, we went under restrictions with East Lancashire and parts of West Yorkshire. It was that geographical footprint. And it was pointed out to me at the time that that was the exact footprint of the housing pathfinder projects of the, uh, the, the Labour government of the 2000s, of which I was a member, where you know, there was a recognition that housing needed to be improved. But that was a, a previous failed attempt to level up those, uh, those communities. They still haven't been leveled up. And it's that toxic combination of insecure work poor quality housing, which led to the virus taking a much firmer hold in those places, uh, as, we've, as we've seen over, over, the, over the time. And, and what needed to be in place was an isolation policy, which covered people's work and their accommodation situation. So if people didn't have the space at home to self-isolate safely from other vulnerable family members, they should have been put up in hotels, as other, other countries did. And for me, that is therefore my big point uh, here. Uh, and you know, the, the point I started with, you know, we, we, we kind of turned straight to the centralized medicalized interventions and we didn't do anything like enough uh, to focus on the, the, the bottom up social interventions. And that is true more broadly, as I was saying in, in more normal times. The reason why we've had communities left very exposed to this pandemic is because we've allowed a situation in this country uh, for far too many of our fellow citizens to live with the, the combination of insecure work and poor housing, which daily, every single day, never mind in a pandemic, chips away at their physical health and at their mental health. And this is, for me, what, what we need to, to rethink. If we are serious about closing health inequalities in this country, we need to put the work of Professor Sir Michael Marmot absolutely at the heart of any drive to build back better, or in his words, to build back fairer. And that is what we are trying to do uh, in Greater Manchester. We commissioned our own inequalities commission led by Professor Kate Pickett. And she came to very similar conclusions uh, as, as Michael, that um, the, the, the very, uh, uh, fragile nature of people's lives in our poorest uh, communities means that they are simply not able uh, to protect their health. And my message to the government coming out of this is that you know, levelling up can't be about big infrastructure or even scattering capital projects to favoured places across the country. It has to start in the workplaces and in the homes of people in the poorest communities that, that have been hit hardest by this virus. We need to improve their work. So we are talking here about a good employment charter for Greater Manchester that is based around a real living wage, a ban on enforced zero hours contracts, making sure everybody has what we call living hours, enough hours uh, of work to earn uh, a wage that will take them above uh, the poverty line. 
um, that gives them a degree of flexibility with their work to manage home uh, pressures. We wish to link the Greater Manchester Good Employment Charter to all public procurement in Greater Manchester coming out of the pandemic, a bottom-up drive to improve the quality of people's work, because without that, we don't believe that we can improve people's health. But actually, in many ways, even more fundamental to that is, is a housing policy that supports, that supports people's health. I, through my work on homelessness, Arpan, that you mentioned at the start, have really kind of come to understand the centrality of good housing to good health. You, you can't have good health without good housing. And yet, this is another example of how we've got things wrong in this, in this country. You know, we, we don't have a housing market that provides a good, safe home for everybody. In the private rented sector in Greater Manchester, 40% of our properties are beneath what we call the decent homes standard. So there are tens of thousands of people living in homes which damage their health. And incidentally, the landlords that rent out those homes to those people, often absent landlords, many of them unscrupulous in the way that they, they operate. You know, they take in public money through the benefit system, but they don't reinvest any of that money in the, up, the safe upkeep of those, of those uh, properties. It's, it's wrong, but how can it make sense to have a situation where housing is damaging people's health, where people might then need the, the, the health services to, 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 to deal with those issues, and then we send people back from hospital to unsafe housing. It, it doesn't make sense. And I've always been very struck as a, a sort of history, as, as a student of the history of the labour movement, and particularly of uh, the great Aniram Bevan, how coming out of the Second World War, he was Minister of State for Housing and Health. And though it was very clearly understood at that moment in this country's history that you couldn't have one without the other. So that you, you had alongside the creation of the NHS, that huge post-war drive to build good, affordable housing for people, council housing up and down the country. And I think in these post-pandemic times, or as we, we enter the post-pandemic times, we need exactly the same thing. We need a massive drive to improve housing for everybody uh, across the country. And actually, the drive to improve people's housing is actually something that, that ties in with our obligations to rise to the climate crisis. Because of course, to do what we want to do and make Greater Manchester zero carbon, we will have to retrofit every single property in Greater Manchester by our target date of 2038. And if we were to do that, Obviously, we would be improving people's homes. It would be a home improvement program right across the city region. But we would also be unlocking tens of thousands of good quality jobs for our residents, jobs that would have a long lifespan as the country retrofits uh, to, to meet its climate obligations. So coming out of this, you know, we could, by rising to the climate crisis, uh, solve the housing crisis. We could also do something serious about the jobs crisis. And all of that build people's, builds people's health from the bottom up. So the big summary, Arpana, for me, living through what we've lived through and obviously learning from the different roles that I've had in my career, is that the truth of the matter, health is not built in hospitals. It can be kind of restored in hospitals, but the truth is health is built in homes, it's built in communities, it's built in workplaces, or it's not built in those places. It can be destroyed in those places. And I'm really struck, following my work on, uh, on homelessness, where I was encouraged to go to Finland to see how they view housing. They have a policy of housing first. And housing first is a specific homelessness project where people get a home provided plus support. But it's more than that, as I discovered when I went to, to, to Finland. Housing First is a national philosophy that says you cannot have good health, good education, or a good life without the foundation of good housing behind you. So I think we should adopt Housing First as a national policy here. Uh, I think it's the best health policy that any country uh, could, uh, could adopt. I, I do think the time has come in this country to fundamentally reassess how we think about health 
And obviously that, that's an, a, a moral imperative on, on all of us coming out uh, of, of a pandemic. Yes, we will always need those over-centralized, medicalized interventions that I spoke about at the beginning. Of course we do, and nobody would argue otherwise. But we mu must now lay much greater emphasis on those bottom-up social interventions, because in the end, changing people's health in the 21st century is going to be about changing people's behavior, changing people's lifestyle, empowering people with knowledge, and that can only be done bottom up. It cannot be done uh, top down. And those are my reflections from this, this pandemic, and I hope they're of relevance uh, to your considerations and of value uh, to, this, uh, to this International Festival of Public Health. And I'll hand back to you on that note, Arpana. Thank you, Andy. And I think um, you've very much um, captured everything that we've been thinking in the public health community. And with our national lead, one of the key things that we found from something called the urgent public health research themes, it's exactly as you say, Andy, they're all based on medicalized interventions. And even now, as we're looking um, to uh, whatever comes next with the pandemic, with flu, with all the other things, um, the impact of all of the measures, how we've left people behind, as you mentioned, through some of the policy decisions uh, that have meant that we haven't fairly been able to help all of those. Um, that are in need um, even before the pandemic, uh, this tsunami of different things building on each other, it's going to be, as you say, looking at communities. And I know our fellow researchers from um, Leeds Beckett University is on the call with us, but it's one of the things um, we really wanted to discuss with you, Andy, because um, it's something that we have been building on here in Manchester with our Director of Public Health here and um, our communities. And it's the co-production of looking at poverty alleviation strategies. So we'd greatly appreciate some time with you to, to think that through and um, the whole Build Back Fairer. Andy, I know um, you're on a strict timetable. Are you able to take questions? Sure. Oh, I'm good till half past, if that helps. Oh, um, fab. Um, so uh, we have um, a question about uh, whether, in your opinion, you think that um, the uh, government will be able to appreciate the true nature of public health. And you've, we've mentioned Marmot, um, uh, we've mentioned Kate Pickett. Do you think that this is now the time for us to really get our message across? I think so. I, I genuinely do, because there's three things coming together here, isn't there? There's the kind of new reflections on health and what it is to have health or not uh, as a result of the pandemic and, and health being very much more at the heart of everyone's thinking and, and health and all policy things. So that's one thing. Then we've got climate, as I mentioned, which could be a catalyst to drives to improve health. So obviously we're bringing through the um, Greater Manchester Clean Air Zone um, next year. And you know, that seems to me to be just absolutely the thing to do now. now. But the climate, rising to the climate crisis becomes a driver to improve people's work, improve people's homes, improve people's transport, improve people's communities, more cycling and walking. You know, so, so that is a thread here. So you've got health as a thread, climate as a thread, but then you've got leveling up as another one. Um, which you know, we don't disagree with as a guiding principle. Of course, it's a brilliant one, to be honest. It's great that the, we have a government that's saying regional inequalities matter. What's not so great is the way they're going about it. And it's becoming a sort of, I don't know what it's becoming. <laughs> Actually, uh, if, if, you, if, you, if levelling up is to, see, to be serious as a drive, you've got to start with the places that are furthest behind. And you've got to start with interventions that deal with the basics in those places, homes, jobs, transport. So, you know, there's, there's opportunity here to kind of weave a kind of new narrative, if you like, about rising to climate to improve health and 
lives and deliver that vision of good lives for all that Kate Pickett spoke about. And, you know, I, so that gives us an opportunity, our partner is what I'd say. And one thing I haven't talked about as much as I should is, is mental health, because I think after the COVID pandemic, there is a, it leaves behind a, a, a mental health pandemic. And I think all of the things I've just spoken about need to be carried out at pace if we are to lift people's mental health uh, coming out of this. Otherwise, we are looking at new inequalities um, opening up and opening up very quickly indeed. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, you can be pessimistic coming out of this. Actually, I'm still on the side of this is actually a really potentially kind of transformative moment in the way we think and work. Mm. And I'm going to be saying to the government later this year, you know, we're, we're ready to do, as great to manage, a levelling up deal with you where we are empowered to build the housing in our most hard hit communities, the social housing that we need where we're empowered to deliver a London-style public transport system with London-level fares that people can afford, where we want to have good employment baked into everything that, that we do and lifting standards from the bottom up. But we kind of need to do that together. You know, you will not level us up top-down from Whitehall. You know, it just won't happen. Um, and it's, it's, it remains to be seen whether the government are, are in the space of doing a deal of that kind. Thank you. And on a similar note, um, because we obviously have um, the real need for that urgency in that the time is now, but having evidence-based approaches and David's posted about ensuring that um, we, when we implement these interventions that there's an evidence base so that we don't end up with unintended negative consequences. I Yes, or oh, no, sure, I, I, I would absolutely agree with, uh, with David on that. But I also, I think sometimes, and I'm being honest here, government hides behind demands for evidence bases as a reason not to do what they should do. You know, there's always, oh, well, the evidence is not quite there yet. And, you, and so, I'm sorry if this sounds, I'm not being provocative, David, by the way, I do agree with it. I would say we had the evidence base back in 2010 when, Michael Marmot gave me his first report uh, on health inequalities, and that evidence base was sitting there for a decade and wasn't, wasn't acted upon. I just think it's, it, yes, we need evidence, but it's, it's almost, it is simple as well, though, in saying, if you give people secure, fairly paid work, you are also ensuring they've got secure housing because they know they can pay the rent. And you are laying a foundation for physical and mental health if, if people have basics. But the truth of the matter is we've all experienced over the last 18 months, but we knew anyway before we went into the pandemic, two, hundreds of thousands of our fellow residents and citizens are living life without the basics that, that support good health. And, you know, we can't wait forever for the evidence. It is all, part of this is about evidence, but part of it is absolutely just profoundly simple as well. And, you know, we, we need a sea change, if you like, in, in thinking around, you know, there was an incredible report um, came out this week from Philip Alston. I don't know if, the, if colleagues saw it, you know, the former UN rapporteur on the privatisation of buses in England. And it basically describes how um, it led to loss of opportunity, has impacted on people's is on isolation, mental health. I think... We've seen that we've relied upon market solutions to transport to housing and they haven't delivered. So basically what we've got here is people are living life without the basics and a highly unregulated workplace leaves people on zero hours contracts. All of that is a toxic combination in the poorest communities that destroys people's health and well-being. And I live in hope that some, somehow, somewhere, as a society now, we move away from some of this idea that the market will just solve the basics for everybody. It really doesn't. And, you know, if, if left and right can agree on that, because the, my side of politics has kind of bought that mantra as well at times. Markets have their place, but it's not in, not, it's not in my view in, a, in supplying to every citizen of this country the very basics that they need to live a good life, which is well-paid work, secure housing, affordable transport these things have to be provided possibly partly by the market but where the market doesn't provide governments have to step in and ensure that all citizens have those things and i can't see any 
kind of positive future for closing health inequalities that doesn't have a sea change in thinking about that. Provocative note to end on there. And I'll find it. The, the best ever way to leave a talk, I think. And <laughs> Andy, we've got so many questions on Twitter, on YouTube and in the chat. Um, but it was just so great to hear you speak. And we're just so pleased you're our mayor. And oh, thank you very we're much. here so nice to you. support you um with how with your plans um and we hope that um we can through working together uh, get some of those those key challenges sorted Definitely. i wish i just i'm sorry we, I, i'm going to sort of uh, carry on the loving because we're just so lucky to have you in the university indeed all of our universities you, you're really getting more and more knitted into great manchester devolution and we we really really value that and actually, that's a great thing that devolution allows, isn't it? It allows universities to mm. kind of move into the sort of real space where policy is made. And it's exciting, yes. isn't it, when you can sort of work in, in that way. But the positive note I'll end on is I actually do feel this will be a, a moment where there is plenty of change for the better. There'll be plenty of challenges that, that come out of the pandemic. But I think it will change kind of thinking. And I think genuine positives will, 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 come, will come from it. Well, we, we can only hope so, can't we? And uh, the more okay. we gather and talk like this, the more likely that might become. So thanks yeah. for having me, everybody, and thank you for listening. Thank you, and we'll keep trying until we get there. We will. <laughs> thank you. Cheers, all. Thank you very much, um, and thank you for the questions. Um, we will uh, be answering them offline if we don't get a chance to ask our panellists. Um, uh, I will move on to Paul. Paul, are you, are you with us? I, I am. Can you hear me all right? Oh, fantastic. Great. Paul, thank you so much. Um, so this is the ritual bit where I, I thank our speakers. And Paul has just been one of those amazing people that have helped our department our research, our capacity building, and um, just personal um, thanks to him. Uh, we started off um, knowing about Paul through Martin Regan, and then um, had the greatest pleasure of working with Paul um, on our Well North programme um, that I'm sure we'll be talking about um, for years to come and uh, just wanted to hand over to Paul now to introduce our very special uh, memorial lecture for Aidan Halligan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Arpana. Thanks for those lovely words as well. And, and what a fantastic couple of presentations. And, and Andy's presentation just fills me with a lot of inspiration. Um, amazing messages about working uh, with with communities, bottom up, social empowerment. I mean, these are things that I, I've very warm, very much warm to things I saw in West Africa when I worked uh, on the Ebola outbreak uh, a few years ago. But look, I, I'm very pleased to say a few words. This is really an introduction uh, uh, to this year's Aidan Halligan Memorial Lecture guest speaker, uh, which is Duncan, Duncan Selby. And I can, I'm hoping Duncan uh, is there as well. And do feel free to put your camera on, Duncan. Um, but uh, I want to just say, before I come to Duncan, just a, a couple of other things I wanted to cover about where we are in the pandemic, uh, building on what uh, Andy and Andrew uh, have said, uh, and then something about Aidan, and then I'll, I'll come on to, um, to, to Duncan. So on the pandemic, well, um, I completely concur with uh, what Andy has just said. Um, we are at a seminal moment in our history, not just in the region, the north, the country, uh, but the world. And um, uh, it, it does feel like that. And let's hope, there's, to quote Andy, there's plenty of opportunities for change for the better. When I, um, I, I was until last year, the North of England Regional uh, Director for PHE, uh, and before that, I was a Regional Director of Public Health. And before that, I was a DPH in Teesside. Uh, and I know I speak very genuinely that uh, we've all worked hard on public health over the years, working with communities, with councils, with the NHS, uh, with some great partners, with universities, such as, as, as uh, the University of Manchester. And indeed, we've seen some fantastic 
work and some great successes, um, look no further than uh, Greater Manchester for that. But I can say that with a genuine uh, hand on heart, we've seen some amazing work across the north of England in particular. Uh, and indeed, in, uh, in the 2000s, when we had a national strategy for health inequalities and we were able to join up, perhaps in a slightly medical model, but join up the NHS with local government, um, who were coterminous in those days, um, we we're actually able to reduce the health gap between the richest and the poorest over that decade. But we've been swimming against a tide in the last few years, and health progress has stalled. Uh, and in part, that's due to the financial crisis in uh, 2008. Um, we did recover from the financial crisis to a point, but we didn't build back resilience. We didn't learn from a catastrophe such as 2008, and particularly resilience for uh, our communities and, and public services. And austerity certainly uh, made that harder, particularly here in Manchester, Greater Manchester, and across the north of England. And then we had the biggest health catastrophe in 100 years. And it's, as I said, it's hit everywhere, globally, nationally, regionally. And it's hit the most deprived communities most, as Andy was said. But uh, Andrew was showing some slides earlier. It's hitting them right now. With, with This is over the, eight, the last 18 months. Over the last 18 months, the indices, the health indices have worsened. If you were talking about Michael Marmot's uh, Build Back Fairer, brilliant report. Uh, just look at some of those graphs, how things have deteriorated in the last 18 months in particular. And uh, I've been involved in this game for about 30 years or so. I thought I would never, ever see such a deterioration in health as I've seen in the last, uh, uh, I've seen in the last few months absolutely extraordinary catastrophe. And behind those diverging lines, of course, are terrible tragic stories of families with deaths, illness, uh, personal stories um, in touching all our families, including mine. Um, but it's affected the poorest communities first. And we've seen that with food banks and uh, the impact, the greater impact of, of uh, education in the poorest areas and on local economies and the way that Andy was describing earlier. So there's never been a more important time to build back. And I think this uh, conference is a, a real um, pointer to, to how we, to, to, to galvanizing uh, our ability to pick ourselves up off the floor, because some of us have been working many hours a day uh, for the last 18 months. But we need to work with our communities, our public services, and learn from the crisis of uh, uh, 2008, where um, we need to build back resilience in our communities, not just um, uh, a kind of recovery, but genuine resilience. And everyone has a role, uh, as Andy described, and particularly universities have a role. And our partner, I'm really, uh, I, I can't, I'm so passionate that we see our Northern universities play a very strong hand in uh, pandemic and recovery and resilience evidence. We're getting there, but we're still somehow there's a north-south divide at play. And I really would like to think through how we work through addressing that. It's, it's, a, it's, it's clearly a tragedy, but it's a massive opportunity as well. And um, I hope there are some pointers there and to use this conference to think through what those, what those opportunities are. Coming on to Aidan, Aidan would have loved an opportunity and he'd have loved this opportunity, tragic uh, though it is. I, I first met Aidan um, in the early 2000s uh, when he was uh, came in from being a mainstream clinician and he was a, the deputy chief medical officer. And um, he had a passion for working with the poorest, wanting to do good, uh, wanting to expand into social uh, interventions as well as the traditional medical uh, interventions and we just got on like a house on fire and of course we start we're also in at the beginning uh, with PHE Public Health England when that started and um, of course Duncan uh, knew Aidan long, be long before me when he was Director General of Commissioning uh, for the NHS in the 2000s but in the early days in PHE the three of us used to meet and I was so energized by Aidan and his passion 
And some of my best memories, Duncan, from my best memories come from those early meetings with you and him. And of course, from that, we have um, the one of the ideas that came from that was the Well North project, which um, I know we spoke previously in previous in early in uh, previous um, uh, health festival conferences. But it's a, a genuine attempt to uh, to help the poorest, fastest, and the most deprived communities. Um, and there are two pilots in this city, ten across the north, um, and of course uh, the university is playing a massively important role in uh, in evaluating that in a way that is also um, challenged with the tradition of evaluation, which I think is a fantastic contribution. Um, Aidan left us far too early, of course, and we all miss his huge inspirational uh, leadership. Uh, and um, his spirit for wanting to do good, to see progress, to work with the poorest and most uh, disadvantaged, that spirit still lives on. Uh, in us and in many people that he worked with. And I want to move now just to Duncan before I pass the mic to Duncan, because talking of inspirational leadership brings me very nicely to introducing uh, Duncan Selby, our, our keynote speaker for the Aidan Halligan Memorial uh, Lecture. Duncan is now president of the International Association of National Public Health Institutes, or IANFI. Uh, as well as being a senior advisor to the Saudi Public Health Authority. And I'm sh I know he'll be speaking about that shortly. Um, but of course, many of you know Duncan as better for uh, being the founding chief exec of Public Health England starting in 2012. Duncan turned an enormous task at the time in 2012 and 13 when it officially started. He brought together 5,000 I'd say fairly difficult um, public health professionals, scientists, labs, managers uh, from about a hundred organizations. He brought it into one national public health agency and he provided the inspirational leadership, not just to uh, bring us together, but to make us greater than the sum of our parts. He hardwired purpose, but with respect and kindness into the organization and I, his legacy uh, lives on very much so. Um, there have been some amazing achievements. Um, I mean, few can say that, uh, that some one person can meet and know 152 local chief executives, but Duncan every week, often two or three times a week would be out there networking, visiting them in their councils, meeting the NHS leaders alongside and local community leaders and elected mayors, which Andy will know, um, not just once, but several times, often a year. And you know, that provided a real glue to the system because he was able to, uh, in one day in the morning, uh, speak with the DPH and visit communities in Bolton, say, uh, uh, and then in the afternoon, he'd be walking in the corridors of Whitehall uh, with that, uh, charged with that information. And then internationally, Duncan worked hard um, on PHEs and PHEs reputation grew uh, at that time as well. And uh, up, up there to be amongst the best with the US CDC, China, France, Germany and others. And when I worked in Sierra Leone a few years ago, I was really staggered, struck, staggered by the fact that if I said I came from PHE, first of all, people knew that, knew what PHE was, but also how much we were held in such high regard in an international setting like that with the whole international community. It was a fantastic uh, um, place to be uh, working for PHE and still is, of course. Um, IANFI, the organization I mentioned, actually peer reviewed uh, PHE uh, alongside many other uh, international um, public health agencies and regarded it as one of the best, if not the best in the world. And I think when I, uh, we obviously uh, looking now at moving into new arrangements, I think perhaps one of our problems was after the years of austerity, that um, our problem was there wasn't enough of us actually, that uh, we needed to be bigger. Uh, and, um, but of course, we're looking at the opportunities of expanding now uh, with the new institutes uh, and new arrangements for public health going forward. So Duncan is now the president of IANFI, 
and um, a collaboration of the world's agencies. Uh, and um, I can tell you that um, there can be no better time for international collaboration as now for all the reasons I mentioned, that this is um, a hugely opportun opp op a moment of opportunity to build back better from and fairer uh, after um, the COVID experience. So Duncan, I'm very pleased to pass the mic to you now and um, ask you to uh, give us the uh, Aidan, Aidan uh, Halligan Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Duncan. Paul, Paul thank you so much. Um, I need to be allowed on to video. Um, I'm, I'm told that I can't start because the host has to let me, let me come on, uh, start my video. Hello, everyone. Um, am I am I live? Yes, you are. You are indeed. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well, Paul, thank thank you. Um, not sure how to respond to that, um, other than with my heartfelt thanks and Apana and to everyone for having me join you today. Uh, I am I'm actually quite distressed because having listened to uh, Andy um, and then uh, hearing Paul, I'm, I'm going to have to scrap everything uh, that I might have said. Um, but I, uh, because it, it was just so, um, so, so much where I think we, we need to be um, for, for the next number of years. Um, but let, let, me, let me reflect a little, um, and then perhaps through a Q&A we can uh, explore more, 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 more deeply. Um, if I, but, but, but perhaps my second beginning is to acknowledge um, what Paul had to say about Aidan. Um, and just to say that he he was a coach and an inspiration, but he was also my friend. And um, I realised that you know that wasn't unique to me, but it was it was it was it was how I always felt. And and you know he he was always going to do good, as as Paul said, whatever. He was also a, a disaster with a business plan. Um, so you know we together we were we were quite dangerous. So thank you, Apana, again as well. Um, the first to say, well, I've been in public service uh, for 40, 41 years. I still am. I'll come on to IAMFI uh, in, in a moment. But for 24 years as a, a chief executive, and my, my starting chief executive role was in the mental health services um, and ending in, in public health England. Um, and I could say one thing about each of those roles and then something that ran through them all. Um, in, my, in my years, 10 years in all, five years as the, the chief executive in the mental health services, is I think possibly where I learned the most um, and it remains with me today. But it was also the most tense time because in the mental health services, serious mental health services, um, it's all about managing risk. And that was, a, that was the most formative time of my career. And then uh, I moved into a strategic health authority for those that are old enough to remember and learn about how do you work with and through other organizations over which you, you don't have sovereignty, but, but you need to work together. And that, that led me to working in the Department of Health um, where uh, I think I worked the hardest in my entire life. Um, and we're working nationally, and Aidan and I used to talk about this a lot. You can do great good, the very important things you can do to improve services and outcomes, but you can also do great harm, and, and, and often you don't know that. And, and the important thing is to be able to, to leave in order to be able to see uh, the difference and, and to come back in again, perhaps, perhaps later. Um, I then moved into acute um, services down in, in Brighton and, and in Sussex, and these were my happiest years. They were uh, huge fun. I, I went down to Brighton thinking that I'd have a rest after working at the Department of Health and then discovered it was far from that, but it was, de it was, definitely, it was definitely the most fun I've ever had. But if I ever wanted to, to talk about where did, where did I had most impact or where did I think the greatest impact could be had, it was with the public, uh, in the public health services. 
and my honour and privilege to to uh, to lead to lead public health England. So for those that are uh, listening in who are considering a career, perhaps at university, perhaps in the early stages of making decisions, uh, I can say to you that um, the most impactful, uh, the, the the most rewarding uh, career that you can have in the health and care system is in is in public health. Um, I'm now the um, the president of IAMFE, which which Paul's referred to, which is the International Association of National Public Health Institutes. These are the agencies and institutes uh, that are part of government, and the directors or chief executives of of all of those uh, institutions. There's over 110 uh, in membership, 95 countries, and increasing, covering every continent of the planet, um, with uh, about five billion people covered. Uh, and we have um, a networks in Asia, uh, in, in the Americas, in South America, in Europe. Um, and we are, um, um, you know, we're thinking now about the, 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 the experience of the, of the last 18 months and two years. Um, and if not now, when? If not now, when? Um, for how we address some of these issues that, that Andy and, 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 and Paul spoke to. But whether you're in Mexico or you're in Rwanda or you're in China, Ethiopia, Bangladesh, the whole world, the whole world is, is tackling uh, these issues. We're all starting in different places. We're not all equally well resourced. Actually, the amount of resource you've got hasn't been the biggest determinant of performance during the pandemic, but we have all experience the same challenges um, and as a family I always thought of it as a family within within uh, the UK and within England in particular uh, but the whole world is a family um, about how we um, how we build back as as others have said not only better but 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 fairer uh, and they talked about um, um, you know, or was asked about evidence. And I, I don't know if it came through, but I sent a little message that just said, we don't, you know, I agree, we don't need more evidence. What we need is to, is to properly resource it and, and to implement it. And there's nothing new that we need to discover. Um, Marmot, as you, you know, you, you'll have referenced, has, has, you know, again, published an excellent report about the um, um, about Greater Manchester, but you know we've had many of those, um, and I don't, we don't need more evidence. And I think Paul spoke about the twenty eight, the two thousand and eight uh, financial crisis, which is of course was a, a very difficult time. But I've come on to talking. Actually, it's also about political will. Um, uh, it's about funding and about political will. Um, you know what organisations care about by how they choose to budget and what they choose to spend their money on. Um, you, you can look at mission statements and you can uh, search for all the right words, but in truth, just look at how the budget is set. Um, and as a whole world, uh, it's not a unique thing to the UK. Um, the old uh, level of uh, resourcing and political commitment uh, to, to the public's health uh, has has not proven has not proven sufficient. I'll, I'll come back. I'll, I'll come back to that. But I was going to begin, um, and then uh, I think about what do we mean by the public's health? Uh, Andy has, has covered that, as as has Paul. Uh, I would often ask uh, when uh, travelling around England, now doing this in, in across the world. Um, when you, if you, what, what are you trying to do? What are we trying to do? Are we trying to improve the healthcare system, um, uh, better outcomes, more consumer focus, better efficiency? Um, and if that is the object, then you have a series of strategies about how you might uh, go about that. But if we were to ask the question, uh, how do we improve the health of the people? You would start, you would start in a different place. And the most important place to begin is, is, is the economy and, and prosperity and getting money into, into people's pockets. And the, the single biggest determinant of health outcome is, uh, is, is income, uh, money, money in your pocket. And then a series of uh, choices, behaviours that uh, people um, 
uh, you know, exhibit whether to smoke, what, how much to, to eat, whether to exercise, if you take alcohol. And of course, these are choices, but the way the, 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 the much wider, depending on your on your prosperity. Uh, and, and then only then do you come on to the impact of treatment. And again, as, as Andy said, it's not that treatment doesn't matter and that hospitals and uh, health healthcare systems don't matter. Of course they do. But when it comes to improving the health of the people and health outcomes, they matter the least of, of those of those three of those three of those three themes. Um, Andy talked about uh, homes and, and jobs, and he added on on transport. For many years, I've been uh, speaking about jobs, homes, and friends, um, about the importance of social isolation. We talked about mental health as as well. But but the point being that social determinants are hugely are hugely important, and and they're not new. And what the pandemic has done is. Um, bring these bring these to the fore. Um, the whole world um, has been anticipating a global pandemic. We've had a lot of warning of of this. We 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 have uh, we've had SARS, we've had uh, uh, Ebola, uh, MERS, uh, Zika. Uh, now, of course, uh, COVID. And whilst the the world had prepared, um, too little, uh, too now, uh, and and too late. Uh, and the challenges are, um, are immense, and you know I'm hesitant to run through them again. But the the, the financial and um, uh, social impact of uh, asking people to isolate, the closing and shutting of borders, the long term implications of of COVID and of COVID on non COVID, particularly non communicable diseases, uh, have been uh, have been horrendous. And the people who have suffered the most are those that have, have had the least, the underserved uh, communities and financial insecurity. And by any, uh, by any measure or metric, uh, sex, ethnicity, age, uh, but by, by, by the greatest amount, by income, uh, more, more severely affected. But we've also had uh, lots of successes uh, over this uh, period of time on which we can now, now build. And particularly in the collaboration that we've seen uh, internationally um, about diagnostics and on, on genomics, it's been quite outstanding developments, uh, new networks that didn't exist before, sharing of data that never happened before, um, the development of the vaccines um, and uh, the way in which uh, that's been an international an, in, an international success and new treatments um, that, that simply didn't, didn't, didn't exist before. Uh, many successes, but again, um, looking at, you know, well, who has most uh, benefited? Um, as of this month, July, 24% of the world uh, has had uh, one dose of a vaccine. Um, um, but, but, you know, that drops to 1% uh, for, for low-income countries. And, and so the challenge for all of us uh, around the world, uh, been said by many, but let me say it again today, is an, unless or until uh, we can find a way of uh, benefiting the entire world, all of the world, uh, with uh, these uh, successes in vaccines and new treatments, uh, then, then we will not defeat this virus and we will not we will not make the progress that, that we know that, that, that we need to. Uh, so part, part of the, the work of IAMFI over the last year has been to think about how are we going to be uh, giving more voice and more visibility, uh, more advocacy uh, for the public's health um, in, in the world than, than hitherto. And we're, um, uh, we're, you know, we're part of the, um, 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 the, the international infrastructure with the Global Fund and uh, the, the, the World Health Organization. And together we have developed a new strategy. Uh, it's got five parts to it. Um, it's on a page. It, it's, in, it's been built by the most um, inclusive process I have experienced over my, uh, uh, over my years, involving all the member countries around the world, the regional representatives, the regional offices of the, of the WHO, Geneva, the Gates Foundation, and uh, the Global Fund, and, and, and many others. 
and the uh, work of the next five years will be about implementing those, uh, playing our part in implementing those those priorities. And they, and they are very they're very simple. They 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 they, they range from um, about how we ensure that that we have uh, the right data available um, uh, to decision makers uh, at, at the right time. That, that we're using standardised data and understanding of the data. Um, this is our, our first pandemic in 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 the internet age, uh, in the age of five G. Um, we, we all thought, in fact, we did have very, very good surveillance systems in many parts of the world, but not sufficient for uh, the, the pandemic and uh, not sufficiently uh, wired into each other uh, across the world. New ways to collaborate. Um, um, and, you know, we're seeing uh, discussions happening through the G20 and the, the G7 and, and led by the World Health Organization about how we ensure that uh, for example, on genomics and, and the new variants that we are, um, you know, that, that, that we're working, that we're working together. Um, Paul mentioned I'm presently helping in Saudi Arabia and for the whole of the Gulf region, um, the, uh, the, the Saudis are looking to, to be able to, to support the genomic modeling, um, the analysis and modeling. And, and we wish to replicate this in, 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 every, in every region of the, the world. Uh, early warning systems. Uh, the Robert Koch Institute in Germany, working with WHO and, um, and increasingly around the world about how we are more ready using, um, if you like, uh, smoke alarms rather than fire engines to be, to, 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 to be, to be early advised about new problems so that we can uh, respond more, more effectively. And overall, wishing to see uh, stronger, uh, pub, pub, stronger public health systems. Um, and, and, and in truth, there is no separation between um, the importance of communicable disease and non-communicable disease. As, as everyone will know, there are parts of the world that have to deal with uh, both of these, particularly in Africa and major parts of Asia. Uh, but all of the world, the whole world, is facing um, the, uh, the, 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 the health problems of non, non-communicable diseases. So when we think about early warning systems and new ways of collaborating and data and strengthening systems, we're thinking about the public's health in the round in exactly the way that other, other speakers have, have, uh, have, spoken, have spoken about. Um, I have um, three, um, three things to emphasize as, I, as, as we, we move to, to Q&A. Um, the new normal, what, what will it be? Um, we know that the new normal will be more than where we've been, um, not at pandemic level, but how are we going to make sure that this time we learn that we need to be ready and that we need to invest to be ready? And that that is about money, but it's also about political will and it's about positioning the public's health at, at the center, not as a function or a service, but the point the point of a nation and the world is to secure the health of its people. There is no argument about whether the economy matters. It's, it's two sides of the same coin. Um, the, there is no difference between health and wealth. And many, many, many very uh, significant academics, including from Manchester, have been making this point for years. This time, we need to learn that lesson and we need to agree uh, in the full blaze of knowing what the cost has been of not being ready, what the new normal, what the new normal looks like. And that new normal is about funding and about political will, but it's also about how we think about uh, the public's health, which is about national action. It is about what is the NHS in the English uh, context and the UK context. It's the same the world over. But it's also about how we make the public's health or more more personalized in in a digital age and how we reach and hold people uh, in the lives that they lead in the places that they live in the choices that they make in ways that perhaps um, uh, may, may make it easier for them uh, but that will in the main come through you know jobs into places that haven't had them improving work improving housing transport and all the things that we've spoken about it's about recognizing that the new normal for the public's health is not where we've been 
thinking that this is something that somebody else does or can be funded at 5% when we're funding the health service at 90%, uh, but, but what that new normal is. And, and that's a global, that's a, that's a, that's a, a global concern. Uh, the second theme is about uh, thinking about reform of uh, uh, health healthcare systems. Um, this is where I'm, I'm involved in the Middle East, but, but um, I'm aware in my I am for all of this conversation happening in the world over, and the focus on on prevention uh, and the metrics that drive that, uh, and thinking through you know what what we measure matters, and uh, if we measure it, then people will pay attention to it. We need to make sure that we're looking at a broad range of metrics. We're looking at school readiness and young people having work. We're looking at the, the standard of accommodation in the UK context, the difference between private rented and, and uh, social housing and, and the gaps there, as well as the things that we know matter about how long you wait to get diagnosis for cancer or waiting times in hospitals generally. So secondly, uh, reform uh, and about how we place prevention at, at the heart of that. And then finally, encompassing the best, um, the best uh, that we have in the management of communicable diseases, uh, as well as uh, in big capital, as well as uh, how we manage non non communicable disease. Um, um, I, I hope that's been um, in some way additive to what others have said, but perhaps the strength in the in the commonality of of the message, and and to know that uh, whilst we are, are grappling with with this in the UK and in the north and, and the leadership of Manchester in this is the global, uh, the world's concern uh, as well. Uh, Arpana, can I uh, perhaps take any questions, should there be any? Hi Duncan, yes for definite and um, we just wanted to thank you for your leadership through all those years and I think Paul said it all. Um, in, in the introduction to the lecture, but we wanted to definitely add um, through yourself and Aidan, you gave us a vision of what we can do up here in the north and um, the legacy lives on, um, even though the great man um, that was Aidan and his ability to influence, to do all of the things that um, we're so grateful for his legacy to be able to talk to people and really connect at a level that is just not seen um, in, in a lot of um, key people these days. And, and we've always felt that Duncan, you, you had that, saw what was achievable and you allowed us to have that opportunity so a huge thanks before we go Thank to the Q and A's for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Duncan. Can I just say this? You know, I, I love Aidan and, you know, we, we uh, uh, about working with and through people. It didn't matter who it was, it didn't matter. Um, but, but, but if they were willing to, if, to make things better, uh, extraordinary. When I said, I didn't mean it flippantly, you know, I, he and I together were quite dangerous, but, but I always knew that if I had to go before a public accounts committee and explain, you know, all I had to do was take Aidan with me and they'd have no chance. I mean, it, it was simply, it would be, it, it, you know, we, we, would, we would win every time. But, you know, something about optimism, uh, I think most people will know Victor Abbott Diwali um, and he has led Turning Point for many years and, you um, now a peer of the realm and has done great work, I think. I think he's one of the great uh, people of our time. And he stood up at a conference with chief executives and directors and cross local government that I, you know, I have enormous passion for uh, and incredible respect. Um, and, and people were getting a bit down about things and were saying, you know, it, because it, well, you know, it's easy enough to do that. And he looked at everyone and he said, um, do you do realise that we're all paid too much not to be optimistic? 
so and, true. you know, and there was complete silence in the room. You know? <laughs> it did take a minute as the penny dropped. Actually, we need to make this right because actually, it's we are the team. And, uh, you know, if we thought there was a better one, we should let them in. But I, I don't think that's the case, actually. Um, mm. But if we don't, I, I think it's been stolen politically, but I, I, I mean it from the heart. If not now, when? If not now, when? Yeah. When? Yeah. It is now. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyway, thank you, Apana. I, I should stop talking and take the first question. Thank you, Duncan. Um, so the, the first question really is about um, uh, now in this new role at IAMFI, um, what are the synergies that you see and the opportunities that you see that um, we can really build on uh, with you in, in your new role um, with the work that you're doing in Saudi and the Gulf states? And um, are there any uh, key actions that um, we could be working collaboratively as a public health community to, to really focus on that? Well, that is a, a great question. I mean, Public Health England and Public Health Scotland and uh, friends in Wales and the Northern Ireland have been incredibly involved in IAMFI. And, you know, I was first introduced to IAMFI by David Heyman, who's another awesome contributor and uh, was my chairman for five years he was a gift and uh, he first took me to Singapore and then from there understood and 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 for all those years now and so uh, the UK is very heavily engaged and my position is an elected position and um, you know I, I think Andy would be impressed by uh, how many votes I, I got uh, from, from from around the world, not because of me, but because of actually Public Health England and what what we've been doing in Asia and Africa and other parts of the world, and that Paul Paul referred to. So, I think there's so many opportunities, um, but they are around those themes of how we uh, work together, share together, um, publish together academically. Um, uh, do things together um, um, that, um, and you know, one, one of the wonderful public health um, uh, uh, contributions about the field epidemiology training, which has been a uh, real strength of the UK and in the US and now seeing this being developed uh, actually in many, many parts of the world and, you know, the, the opportunity to, to send our people to other parts of the world to learn about things that, you know, and they always come back better and stronger and more engaged and every single individual, every individual that has those experiences comes back saying that, that you know, um, that they, that they're never the same again. And, you know, we, we you know, I would, I, if, if I could do anything, it would be to inspire uh, students to uh, enter this world because we, we need more people and, and we need young people and we need to be we need to be using IAMFI to uh, in, encourage all, all of that, but also the the world through the, inf the international infrastructure, like the World Health Organization, are asking IAMFI uh, to become uh, formal members to give us um, uh, the right of entry to the high level meetings, the World Health Assembly, where the big decisions are taken, and and by January I expect IAMFI will be sitting alongside all the countries of the world. And step in. and my point earlier about the importance of advocacy and mm. speaking about the public's health um, and the UK will be completely central to that. Um, and there are networks, as you know, uh, in the north, um, mm. uh, in many regions of the world. I'm particularly aware of the, the one in in, in Pakistan, uh, which is which is hugely valued, but equally in in uh, in Africa. Uh, the boss of the African CDC. Uh, said he wanted a public health England in every country of Africa. Um, public health England, what he meant was he wanted an integrated public health, you, you know, and, and so our universities in Manchester, you know, we should be helping them with that in every possible way. Oh, thank you, Duncan. We couldn't agree more. And I think um, one of the key things um, that you just mentioned feeds into our next question is um, about the use of celebrity. Because often we know we know that um, 
our populations might be able to relate better to to them. And um, one of the questions is about your thoughts about using these um, uh, very popular people and social media and, and the components that yeah. the younger generation now have about uh, some of the messaging that we we should be getting across. So I'll be, I'll be semi-controversial and say that the future of um, the future of infectious diseases is um, uh, mathematics and engineering and the skill sets that integrated universities like Manchester can bring to bear. The rest of everything is about behavioral science. Everything else is about not more evidence, but about do people pay attention? And, and who, to, to who? To who do they pay attention to? And, you know, we saw the power of Cristiano, Cristiano, you know, uh, uh, Ronaldo, when he said, don't drink, go drink water, yeah? And the importance of um, our own uh, uh, Manchester, uh, about the importance of uh, school meals. And wow. And actually, one of the, I'm very proud of public health. And it's not, I mean, any organize, all organizations make mistakes. I think I said as I exited stage left that no, no, no organization enters a pandemic believing that they'll, they'll leave in, in the same way. But I, I, I stopped myself quoting Frank Sinatra about having regrets, but too few to mention because I'm overwhelmed by respect and, um, and appreciation for what people have done. And then one of the, uh, one of our greatest achievements was around social media and the One You campaign and Mr. October and many others that were all about how do you reach people in the lives that they lead in the places that they live. You might not think that they should, but that's what they choose to do. And unless you're relevant to them in the worlds that they live in and the choices that they're making, they don't listen. And why should they? So I think they have, I think celebrities have a mass, you know, Prince William was hugely important to, uh, you know, in the, in the FA Cup, in the, mm -hmm. uh, you know, about, you know, the, the mental health, the, mo the moment for the mental mm -hmm. health. The first time in British broadcasting where every single channel set aside that minute, first time it ever been done. It was hugely mm -hmm. impactful. The whole conversation about, um, and I didn't catch it earlier, but, but Andy was talking about climate change, but I, I would say about air quality was, is the biggest environmental hazard that, that we face. And, 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 and who's speaking about it is way more important um, and more impactful. So I think, it, I, do, I think it is our future. I think yes. behavioral science is, is where the future is. It's not on its own. We still, of course, need our uh, laboratory-based sciences, but actually the way the world's going and mm -hmm. uh, with the genomics and what in what um in what replaces genomics is is uh is 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 much more multi uh, uh much more multi-faculty than perhaps hitherto and the the, the 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 huge difference i think will be in the in the in the, in the behavioral sciences thank you so much duncan that's um hugely encouraging and just wanted to say Thank you again for delivering the Aidan Halligan Memorial Lecture and um, we hope you'll be able to join us next year for our 10th anniversary because um, uh, a lot of the work that we're presenting is down to the, um, the legacy that you've left us with from place-based approaches, the health inequalities work and Well North. So thank you, Duncan. Thank you, Apana. Just, uh, just to say thank you and... Um, uh, I, I, I don't know whether I went out the front door or the back door, but I've definitely come back in through the window. So I am in, 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 in your space, in where my heart and my head is, and I absolutely want to be part of it. So thank you and for everyone's listening. Bye-bye um, for now. Bye -bye. Thank you. And if Julian doesn't mind, I'm just going to segue a quick presentation um, just to in set some of uh, the scene before he talks just on some of the key things that um, we've been talking about here at the festival, um, but set it up um, in terms of the links um, and um, our speakers today 
and from our other sessions, our parallel sessions, a lot of the work um, that's been ongoing have really been phenomenal. And I'd like to give a big shout out to um, our division that I have the great pleasure to lead on and um, also the links that we are able to make um, with key people um, in, in our university and outside our university, including the Northern University's Public Health Alliance uh, that Paul mentioned, our Manchester Urban Institute, the Thomas Ashton Institute, that's a partnership with um, HSE, that was our first speaker today, um, Policy at Manchester and the Manchester Environmental Research Institute. And um, all of our work focuses on the three pillars of excellence in research, teaching and social responsibility that Julian will be speaking to us about. And we're just so grateful for all the abilities to think through public health in not just projects that are funded for public health, but also those that are in other disciplines. And I think it's just been a phenomenal journey and um, Duncan mentioned um, the field epidemiology. It was one of the first projects that we ever got commissioned to evaluate um, from the Health Protection Agency. And we can definitely say how useful and beneficial that field epidemiology training programme is. Um, we've got a, a, a ton of... Um, uh, publications this year from our students, from our researchers, from our PhD students and um, I'd very much like to thank the team uh, for ensuring that the quality of our research is being able to be shared outside of um, this conference through our publications. I'd also like to say a huge thanks to our MPH team and um, this uh, is, a, is a photo from a previous festival when we were all allowed uh, to meet up. And um, I'd just like to say the immense amount of work um, that goes into our masters. I'm so pleased to see so many of our students. Um, some of these photos are on things that our students said that they wanted to do. Um, so the first one is our Geneva Winter School that may be a Geneva Spring School this year. Um, we're just so proud of our graduates and alumni. Um, we've also um, got our Epidemiology Summer School um, and the ability of our students to present. And obviously we have the festival but we've also, through our partnership with the International Society of Urban Health and the European Public Health Association, got a number of other opportunities for our students. And uh, the bottom right is our hugely successful European Public Health Week that Greg Williams uh, coordinates with the help of key individuals that you can see in this picture. Our International Summer School will be coming back and um, it's gone from strength to strength and we're so um, uh, grateful for our partnerships um, and leadership from um, Hui Go, who's uh, one of our statisticians, um, for that work. All of this led to us launching a BSc in public health. And this focuses on our three year undergraduate programme that's both on and off campus to allow the learning from our online and blended resources for the masters to be put into practice for a new group of people. And just to re-emphasise what Duncan says, um, keeping um, all of the abilities for us to deliver capacity building in all settings of not just um, high income countries, but the global south is really important to us. We were very fortunate to get funding for the hub and our speaker um, uh, 
uh, Sandy has joined us, who I hope will really demonstrate the importance of this trilogy uh, between data science, medicine and public health. But please have a look at our website, our hub um, uh, lecturers and PS staff have just been phenomenal in driving a lot of the work that I'm now just going to focus on, which is what we spoke about with Andy Burnham. And I'd like to thank, and I hope Anne-Marie is still with us, uh, the phenomenal number of people that helped us in our consortium development grant. And we are not going to let this go. We're going to continue with the work because what we know um, from um, all of our research is that we have an, a, a unique opportunity that we spoke about to really think about poverty alleviation in this new phase uh, post pandemic. And um, what Greg and the team found was this inextricable link between health, digital and financial literacy. And also our work that was led by Hannah and Annie uh, that actually co-produced some of the core things that we need to do with our communities and um, being able to really think through what's important to them. And um, uh, these included a lot of the number of things that Andy mentioned and um, is in the Bill Backfarer from um, Sir Michael Marmot's report and how we then come up with the solutions, not just um, measuring. And this is my final slide to thank these amazing people that I have the pleasure of working with and to say a huge thanks um, for the Festival of Public Health and got to embarrass Greg, um, who you'll probably all know um, has been the brains behind the operation with Gary. And so we hope um, that this is something that we can build on and um, without further ado, as I've eaten into Julian's time, I'm going to hand over to the fantastic work that Julian's been leading on and, um, and say thank you for talking to us at the festival. Thank you, Julian. Ooh, mute. Thank you, Apana. I'm delighted to be able to speak today on this panel. It's a wonderful festival. It's the second year in a row. <clears throat> I've been able to take part in this discussion and I just wanted to add to our partner's thanks to say thanks to you, our partner. Um, I think you embody a lot of the principles that we've just been discussing in this session about the practice of public health being something much more than a medical endeavor, how that needs to draw on a range of other disciplines. And I think you really embody in that in your work through your research. You also embody, I think, all three goals of the university, not just our research, obviously, the work you do on our master's program. It's a really pioneering program in public health from a teaching perspective and, of course, social responsibility. And we talk a lot about public intellectuals and what it means today to be a connected academic. And I just want to acknowledge the work you do. I know it's not just you, you've got a team there, partner, but you're somebody, I think, within the university we look to as a really respected ambassador for what a great university can do in its city and in its region. And that's really um, what I wanted to pick up on today. Excuse my little dog. This is the world we live in now. Dylan, please be quiet. Thank you. Um, so um, that's a good one for YouTube, isn't it? So I'll just um, I'll just say that I want to address three things today. Um, something that I think you all know about what the SDGs are. I won't spend very long on that. But then I also wanted to move into why are they important from a public health point of view and why are they important from a, the perspective of a university um, whether it's ours or any university in the world, actually. And then how, how you can make sense of the SDGs through the practical work that universities are doing. And I'll draw on examples from public health. So I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. And if somebody can say that looks OK. Um, is that OK, Greg? Or Brilliant. That okay? Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So... Um, First thing I wanted to do, you'll know about the, the, the 17 SDGs, I'm sure. Um, these, some people think they're a natural continuation of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. And there's three just quick things which 
many of you will know, but just to make sure, um, they cover all issues rather than sustainability. And I think when people see that first word sustainable, they forget the word development. So they cover 17 different goals of which uh, they're in front of you there. Very few people can remember them. I'm supposed to be something of an expert on this. I can't always remember all 17. It's really difficult, but they are interconnected. So, so they cover a range of issues, interconnected ones. They also apply to all countries. So don't think of these as something that is done in the global south, like the Millennium Development Goals, or they apply as much to city regions, what we do on our doorstep, for example, as a university in Greater Manchester as what might happen in Malawi, for example. They also apply to all sectors. That's what I think is really powerful about these. They apply to the private sector, the public sector, and the not-for-profit sector, and to citizens as well as organizations. So they're a, an amazing framework. And I wanted to give you some examples about how we brought these to life in the University of Manchester. If you can't remember SDGs, when I was uh, first learning, there was a great guide by Mr. Bean there, which you can find as well on YouTube if you want a, a nice beginner's guide. You don't need me to tell you about SDG three, I think. If you're a public health professional, you'll know about this and you'll know about the nine targets um, for sustainable development goal number three. Uh, when these were developed in 2015, launched in 2016 by 190 plus countries around the world signed up to these. Target 3.3, they're fighting communicable diseases. We didn't know that we'd have the worst pandemic in 100 years um, at that time. But obviously, communicable diseases were a key part of the vision of, of providing good health and well-being. And you know better than me that the pandemic has had a, a really detrimental impact on public health around the world. Some of the consequences of which we don't quite know yet, but we do know, for example, that there's spikes in malaria. We know that this is affecting other childhood immunization programs around the world, and it has reversed decades of improvement in health, not just in um, some of the least developed parts of the world, but also in cities like where I live in Manchester as well. And don't forget that what's not changed through this pandemic is that less than half of the global population are covered by essential health services. What's really interesting, I think this provides a brilliant framework, this next slide from the WHO, because it epitomizes, I think, this next slide, everything we've been talking about in this in this session about the interrelatedness of health with other goals. And the WHO took a different take on the 17 SDGs where they put good health and well-being at the center and gave really uh, uh, practical examples where good health and well-being speaks to these other agendas and these other agendas speak to good health and well-being. And this is all, you know, you could look at this in, in the recent, you know, Marmot report again. Um, looking at Greater Manchester and the original report um, a decade ago pointed out very similar things. So take, I don't know, SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. Um, I love my local park. Uh, it's probably gets used about 10 times more now during the pandemic because it was a really important place. The fact that there was investment in that park to make it a nicer and safer place to go means that that has really good impacts on mental health and well-being, on exercise. So I think that's a really good example around building sustainable cities and infrastructure, SDG 11, with good health and well-being. We talked a lot about housing conditions of the poor. So you could look at people in poverty and SDG one and say that has a direct impact on communicable diseases. So I think that's a really good uh, guide. I think it's the best uh, one slide kind of visual representation of the interconnectedness of good health and well-being with the other 16 major goals in the world. But I wanted now to focus in on what, a un what this means to a university, the SDGs. There's four elements really to what a university can do around SDGs. Universities can do research on them. They can do education. We train people, we teach people. We provide leadership around public engagement, cross-sector dialogue. I think what we're doing today is a great example of a university using its status as a trusted public institution to bring people together to have important discussions. And then also universities have to operate and they have to have their own governance as well. And I just thought I'd give you um, four quick examples from my own university, but I think they'd apply to lots of universities for those of you that work elsewhere. But on research, you may have seen the session that Graham Lord did yesterday, I think, um, talking about the number of research projects we've done on COVID-related uh, uh, topics. So in the first six months, 200 plus projects, 73 clinical studies, 8,000 patients recruited to those clinical studies. Um, that's just some of the direct effects of from a health perspective, but um, lots of different research um, happening within the university, ranging from 
a big program we're launching at the moment, uh, the first in the UK to have a systematic way to measure well-being in schools. That's a really pioneering project we're launching at the moment, right through to um, capturing the voices of what's happened in our most treasured institution in the UK, the NHS. We have a project to capture this building on our amazing NHS at 70 piece of public history work where we're partnering with the British Library to capture the real stories of what's happened at this momentous uh, period in our history. So that's a history project connected to the pandemic, but we do all sorts of research. In terms of education, uh, this time last year, about a thousand people from the university, lots of these being our students who we released early to the front line in medicine and nursing, for example, but also members of staff who have dual con contracts in the university, clinical focused staff who were released to the front line We've had more than a thousand hours now of students who've been volunteering to support the vaccination rollout. And I think our partner has, has, has been really helpful advising the university on these operational matters, getting our students involved in this. Uh, we also had a student, Saif Khan, who is now a fifth year medic, who set up a, a national health supporters scheme. This is an amazing scheme. There are now 45 local chapters of it in every city in the UK, where trained medical students partner up with very busy, quite stressed, overburdened uh, doctors working on the front line. And because they have CRB checks, they are people who can help with things like um, uh, providing uh, child care uh, arrangements at home, walking pets, doing shopping, working, perhaps driving doctors around. That's happening in every city in the UK, thanks to one of our students. So through our education function, we've been really busy during the pandemic. Let me tell you a bit about public engagement. During the pandemic, we in the first six months, we reached about 2.4 million people through public um, education, whether they were videos, lectures, demonstrations, activities online. Uh, a great example of this, more than 200,000 uh, young people shared science experiments with us through this amazing global initiative we have called Great Science Share. We also put uh, 195 of our students were trained up to do online tutoring so that disadvantaged children didn't fall too far behind during the pandemic when schools were closed. We also produce a Manchester COVID briefing from our business school as part of the Resilient Cities Network and 50,000 leaders across 4,000 cities receive that uh, twice a month. So in terms of engagement, we do an awful lot. And then just around governance, we talked earlier about the interrelationship of poverty to health. We've had a large group of our own staff who have worked throughout the pandemic. I'm thinking of our security staff, people who clean our halls of residence, um, people involved in providing meals for many of our students who remained in university accommodation, particularly our international students. All of those staff receive a living wage and that's a very important ethical commitment from our university. We also have developed a vaccine center in our, our, on our Fallowfield campus. We've shared testing facilities. We've signed up to a civic university agreement. We're just in the process of that. And you saw Andy Burnham, our mayor, speak earlier. He'll be signing this on the 24th of September, which is an agreement between the five universities to address shared objectives in building back better and fairer uh, post-pandemic. We also voluntarily report um, through our operations and governance against the SDGs, which I'll come on to now. So just to finish up, I wanted, it wouldn't be a good university presentation if I didn't use some Latin. I didn't go to the type of school where I was able to learn this myself directly, but it's very important in where I work now in, in the motto of our university. Those three parts of our motto relate directly to the three core goals of our university. So cognitio, knowledge, of course, and that relates to our role around research, producing the knowledge to address the SDGs and the public health challenges we have today. Sapientia, which is wisdom. How do, what do we do with that knowledge? How do we share that? And I think um, today is a great example of this, where we're trying to, to share this beyond just uh, from a, a basic teaching function, but also share knowledge more widely. But importantly, what's that knowledge and wisdom for? And that's our third motto, humanitas. And that relates directly onto this unique goal we have in Manchester. And I'm the founding director. I have the privilege of that role of, of being the director of social responsibility. And the difference of this goal, I think, the, the first two people often talk of these in terms of what are we good at as an excellence agenda, that we need to do excellent research, excellent teaching. Social responsibility for us asks a different question, what are we good for? 
Uh, and I think that's what social responsibility gets to the heart at within a university. And our ambition is not just to be one of the best universities in the world, but be one of the best universities for the world. I think that's something that we're really proud of some of our achievements, which I'll finish by sharing with you now. If you know anything about the United Nations SDGs, you know there's 17 of them, there's 169 targets and 223 indicators. And I know that Alex will perhaps speak about these. He's, a, he's something of an expert in this, and I'll be really keen to hear what he says in a moment. The Times Higher Education developed something called impact rankings uh, three years ago in 2019. And we voluntarily entered these as a number of universities did. Um, and they, they have 105 metrics and 220 measures. So they came out three years ago. It's the first and only attempt in the world to measure universities' contributions to SDGs. And this is how we performed. In the first year, we were top in the UK um, and third in the world. In the second year, we remained top in the UK and eighth in the world. In the most recent ranking, we stayed top in the UK, but we were really proud to become first in the world. Now, all rankings have their flaws, of course, and we know what the flaws are, having spent a lot of time entering these. So these don't reflect something which is objectively true necessarily, but gives an indication, I think, if we've been top in the UK over that period of time and in the top 10 over these three years, there's a degree of confidence that we're doing something right at Manchester across our range of different activities across the 17 goals. So that's something we're really proud of. And I just wanted to finish up by sharing a short, I think it's about a two minute video, which gives you an example, hopefully, of some of the other things universities do when they're at their best, which all have an indirect or a direct impact on public health. So let me finish up with this and I'll pass over to the next speaker. In 2021, we came first in the world in the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, based on our performance against the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Here's 17 examples of what we've achieved. We've invested more than £15 million each year in financial support for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Our students established Britain's first campus-based food bank right here on campus to address food poverty in local communities. More than 3,000 of our students graduate in healthcare programmes each year. Our Manchester Access programme has supported more than 2,000 local students from families with no experience of higher education into our university. We've achieved 15 charter marks for gender equality. We lead the biggest ever research project in the sustainable development of the world's dams. We are divesting from fossil fuel and other carbon intensive investments. We've become an accredited living wage employer. We formed Health Innovation Manchester to help transform the health and well-being of Greater Manchester's 2.8 million citizens. We are one of the few universities in the UK to hold a charter mark for race equality. We receive more than a million public visitors to our four cultural institutions each year. The Manchester Museum, the Whitworth, John Ryland's Library and Jodrell Bank Discovery Centre. We are the first university in the UK to use the social value portal for measuring impact through our supply chain. We committed to becoming a zero carbon university by 2038. We've already eliminated more than 250,000 pieces of avoidable single use plastics with more to come. We've opened Brunswick Park to enhance biodiversity, support health and well-being, and improve resilience to climate change. We partner with the WHO, Médecins Sans Frontières, and the Red Cross in our humanitarian and conflict response work. We also hold the government register of volunteer health professionals who can be deployed overseas in emergencies. We signed the global SDG Accords to embed sustainable development in all that we do. These are just a few examples of what we do. We want to stimulate new ideas, actions and collaborations so that together we can play our full role in tackling the world's sustainable development goals. Thanks so much, Julian, just um, phenomenal. And we just wanted to thank you for your leadership and uh, collegiality. And we hope to work with you um, uh, for the future uh, activities underway. But thank you so much. You. Um, and I'd like to introduce Sandy and I'm going to cut my introduction short because um, uh, we're running behind schedule and I think our delegates will want to hear Sandy speak.
but so grateful for you being able to join us today and um, really looking forward to hearing your talk. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk uh, from a somewhat different point of view, but I think very focused on the things you're most interested in. So I, what I'm going to do is share a, a PowerPoint because that's what we do in my part of the world. Um, and let's see if we can make that happen. Good, there we are. So um, my name's Sandy. Uh, it's actually Alex, but you know, uh, the Scottish uh, sort of shortening for Alex is Alexander is uh, Sandy. So that's what everybody calls me. And I think about networks of people and uh, you can think of that as social context, but it's not just oh, what's the average person out there? It's exactly who interacts with who and what are the effects of those interactions on particularly child development and poverty. So um, that's what I'm gonna do. Um, the reason this might be interesting to you and, and novel is that we have never had data at a fine granularity the way we have now. And it's due to things like cell phones and credit cards and, and things like that, which is very scary from a, a privacy point of view, but it gives the scientists the ability to sort of look at things at a granularity that has been uh, heretofore really impossible. And of course, we also have statistical tools that are better than ever. And you put the two of those together and it becomes possible to begin to understand things uh, in ways that were not previously really something that was practical to do. And I wanna give you a, a little story um, of something that we did in the last five years. Um, we were uh, at the uh, part of a thing called the Fragile Family Study. Um, and it wanted to ask and answer the question of why do some kids fail whereas others succeed. And fail means things like, you know, they end up in jail or uh, they're homeless or, you know, really fairly catastrophic life outcomes. And, and of course, the way the academia in uh, the United States, and I'm going to be much more sort of focused on the United States because that's where the data is from, is they, they think about kids and as rational and, emotional individuals embedded in, in a family primarily. And um, there are of course a lot of competing theories about how kids develop, what can go wrong, uh, and then what you can do about it. And the US government did something really interesting. It says it did a 20 year study of almost 5,000 children all the way across the United States, all sorts of different uh, neighborhoods and uh, had almost 750 studies of these poor kids that, you know, you know, just imagine people are like ticking the numbers and making them take tests all the time um, and accumulating almost 13,000 observations for each child. And this is reported in uh, uh, the citation down there, which is in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, which is probably the most prestigious general uh, journal in, in certainly the United States. Um, and in these 750 studies was virtually every type of theory about development uh, that you can imagine. So grit, the role of uh, trauma, you name it, right? All these different sorts of theories, people measured it with this instrument and that instrument uh, and came up with all these uh, observations about the children. And then there was a phase where uh, it was opened up to literally thousands of research groups. Uh, in the end, only 160 research groups uh, uh, participated all the way through because it took a, a great deal of effort, of course. But what they did is, is we, we, we went back to all of these studies and all of these data, and we asked, could we actually predict by a reasonable age how the kid was going to come out? 
were they going to be successful members of society? Were they, or were they going to be trapped in poverty? Were they going to have uh, uh, jail time in their future, et cetera, et cetera. And, and my group, because we're uh, sort of a world-class data analytics group, um, was able to do the best in the world at this. We won three of six categories and were quite competitive in the rest. Um, and so, so isn't that nice? Uh, so beat 160 teams, be able to predict things. Uh, the bad news is we were terrible. I mean, not just bad, terrible. All of these teams, all of these measurements did almost nothing to improve predictability of child failure over simple things like single mother family, living in a poor neighborhood, race is a factor in the United States. Those three things were just as good as the 13,000 measurements made by all these different theories by all the leading academics in the entire country over a period of 20 years. That's amazing. <laughs> Um, and the ubiquity of this argues that we don't understand this. We really don't, because they simply did not work at the things that matter most. Was the child going to end up homeless? Were they going to end up uh, uh, incarcerated, et cetera, et cetera? Um, we just couldn't do it. However, we have found that measures of properties of the neighborhood, of the people that a child is exposed to are extremely powerful at doing these same tasks. So let me show you an example. And I'm going to use data from uh, up the river here. This is a, a group uh, at Harvard actually, uh, headed by Raj Chetty. So, this is predicting these uh, uh, intergenerational mobility. So does the kid do a lot better than their parents in terms of income and social status and so forth? And uh, they took all of the data uh, and added to it data from all of the government services, particularly uh, community surveys and, uh, and the internal revenue service or tax data. And what they found was that the immediate neighborhood for a child uh, determines 71% of the outcome. So in a slightly more technical thing, the R squared was 71%. So that's hugely predictive. Most things in social science are not anywhere near that sort of productivity. So that's saying that you could ask questions of the surrounding four blocks, city blocks, and predict whether kids were going to uh, turn out well, turn out better than their parents, or whether they were not. Um, and the things that you had to ask were things that people were generally not aware of, which is one of the reasons that the Fragile Family Study failed to be able to predict things. There are things like uh, exactly what is the distribution of wealth uh, or income in your neighborhood? You know, are there some people that make a lot of money, a few people, how many people are truly desperately poor? And, and the, the specific ratios really matter in this sort of prediction. Uh, other one that was very powerful had to do with measures of social capital. How much do people pitch in to help other people. Um, and it's just, none of these measures are terribly good, but they're not the sort of thing that you as a, uh, a mother or father of a child would generally be aware of uh, in any sort of quantitative way. And then the final thing, which I'll focus on here is, do you live in a ghetto? So we all know famous ghettos, Jewish ghettos from World War II, from way back in history. But many neighborhoods are ghettos in the sense that nobody from outside the neighborhood ever goes there. So that's the sort of thing that I'm talking about here when I talk about a ghetto. That's behavioral segregation. 
So if you live in a neighborhood where nobody ever comes to visit, uh, and perhaps you never visit other neighborhoods or very rarely visit other neighborhoods, um, then that is a type of behavioral segregation, which turns out to be enormously predictive. So um, moreover, this is causal. This is not just something that's observational or correlational. Uh, there was almost by accident, a program, a voucher program that gave people at random vouchers to move to a better neighborhood and they would pay the differential in rate. And um, you have to be a little careful about who you choose and that you don't do a sort of bias in your selection. But it turns out that this exposure effect um, has uh, almost 50% of its variance by the time the child is nine years old. So in other words, if you move out of a really bad neighborhood into a better neighborhood when the kid is five, you get 60, 70% of this neighborhood effect. You do a huge amount to improve the likelihood of this kid uh, uh, moving up the socioeconomic ladder. On the other hand, if you move when the kid is 12, um, the odds of that really helping are pretty small uh, and, and decreasing over time. And so from this, you can infer the causality of this exposure effect and that it's focused on the very young. Let me give you another thing from the same group up the street. So they looked at whether people, uh, whether children were exposed to innovators. So innovators in this case being people who start stores, have a patent, uh, things like that. You should read the paper. Um, it turns out that if boys are exposed to male innovators, it helps their likelihood of being successful hugely but it has no effect on the girls. If the girls are exposed to a male innovator, it has no effect. Uh, sorry, if, if a female innovator is uh, uh, exposed to uh, a boy, um, it has no effect, but a female innovator has a huge effect on young girls' likelihood of doing better in life. Moreover, it's specific to area. If they're exposed to an innovator in information technology, it has effect on their likelihood of being an innovator in information technology, but not in other paths of life. If it's someone who's an innovator in commerce, then it has a huge effect on their uh, ability to uh, likelihood of being uh, an innovator in commerce, but not on IT or biotech or any of the others. So it's, it's extremely and surprisingly specific in its effect. So what's going on? Well, the best sort of theories of human mind uh, uh, from, and this is from Daniel Kahneman and people like that, Nobel Prize winners, is that uh, humans have two ways of thinking. Uh, there's system one, which is this very fast immediate reaction system and system two, which is conscious thinking and, uh, and is much more rational. And we as humans are mostly only aware of system two. We're not really aware of our automatic habits and biases uh, to uh, any great degree at all. But yet 80 or 90% of our uh, biases, our, our, our actions rather, sorry, are determined by system one. We do most of our work on this sort of uh, ac, uh, system one automatic system and very little of our choices are made consciously by our rational system. Now the rational system may make the important choices, but day to day it's all this uh, more automatic stuff. And um, what all this data suggests is this automatic habits of thinking, habits of behavior, habits of reacting are formed very early in life, before age five or six, something like that. And I love this picture. So in the United States, uh, when they take kids out for a walk in a, in a preschool or first grade, they just uh, give them a rope. They make sure the first kid holds the rope and then all the kids just by themselves will copy that first kid. And 
is extremely safe. You can take them through busy streets and things and the kids will actually behave. Uh, and any of you who have had kids know that kids actually behaving is a rare state. Uh, and what they've been in some sense copying each other, this, this urge to learn from each other, to learn how to behave is so powerful that they can hold on to that uh, rope even in the presence of enormous sorts of distraction. So um, a lot of the way we think about kids and certainly in the fragile families uh, study was thinking about the individual child and their development. You know, are they making choices or do they control their emotions, things like that. But in fact, the broader science and it's like Daniel Kahneman again here, uh, so is that these more sort of automatic systems are 95% of everything that we do. And only 5% is the things that we train kids for, the things that for school, the things for, for public health habits, things like that. Um, and the data I just showed you argues that, uh, first of all, the system one stuff, the automatic stuff is not something that kids think through. It's mostly learned by copying other people, by looking for examples. And then parents may yell at them, may tell them all sorts of things, may argue with them and give them facts. That has much less influence than if the other kids do it uh, and then they will copy that sort of behavior. Um, and the social influence, the system one matures very early is what that argue data argue that I showed you. Um, so by five years old, six years old, seven years old, they have essentially sort of an operating system uh, for getting around in the world. How do you react to things? How curious are you? Uh, are you in charge? Uh, is it your responsibility? Those sorts of automatic responses seem to get set in very early. They can be changed, but it's extraordinarily difficult to change. And then on top of that, um, and in later years, we have maturation of the system to the more rational thinking. And what the data I've shown you suggests is that you have to get the social programming right when they're early. You need to provide diverse and positive role models very early, and that is the most important intervention that you can make. Um, remember that, that this fragile family study was 750 studies using all of the best theories about what sort of interventions, what sort of things matter. And the bottom line was all of them were negligible effects. They were significant in many cases. I'm not saying that the science wasn't there. They would get a P equals, you know, less than 0 0.5 or 0 0.1. But in real uh, context, the effects were essentially negligible. On the other hand, positive role models, people who are successful at building their life and ex the kid being exposed to those and learning habits from that seems to be something that is uh, very, very powerful. So um, that's the core argument. You might then ask, well, okay, don't we do that already? We have TV, we have et cetera. And <clears throat> the, uh, I wanna show you some more data that argue that, no, we're really bad at this. Um, so we set up something called the Atlas of Inequality. It's inequality.media.mit. It's data about people moving around in cities for the 11 largest metropolitan areas in the United States, about 100 million people. Um, and what it shows for each neighborhood, each small several blocks of city, where those people shop, where they uh, work, et cetera. And it shows how the populations mix between rich, middle class and poor. And what it's showing actually is that there is enormous segregation and very similar segregation in every city in the United States and that this is increasing. Um, moreover, 
this segregation, and this is behavioral segregation, is most of the effect. So when we think about segregation, we think about residents. Oh, this is a poor neighborhood. This is a rich neighborhood. That's place uh, uh, segregation. Behavioral segregation is, does anybody who's not like you ever come to your neighborhood? Do you ever spend time in neighborhoods that are not like your home neighborhood? And it turns out that the majority of behavioral segregation, the majority of this exposure to other people has to do with patterns of mobility. Where do people feel comfortable going? Where is it easy for them to go in terms of public transportation? Things like that. And not just the factors we normally think about, which are residential. And as I've argued, this lack of diversity of exposure seems to be the principal cause uh, of persistent inequality and the lack of intergenerational mobility. And there's several papers about this. So you say, well, okay, I understand that, but what is the actual mechanism whereby um, this exposure turns into a better life? And I'll talk just briefly about that. Um, so in every country we've looked at, you can derive uh, a relationship like this, which is people with more diverse social networks. So that means they visit very different sorts of neighborhoods, <clears throat> always make more money. People who live in ghettos make less money. And you can tease this apart in various ways and, and find out that this is not a function of, well, rich people travel more. The causality really is, is that as you visit more places, you gather more opportunities, you meet more diverse capabilities, your life becomes uh, larger in the sense that you can do more things and you can therefore become more prosperous. So it's in that direction. Essentially, diversity of interaction gives you a greater portfolio for uh, building a better life. And there's a, a citation to that. The problem is of course that some neighborhoods are very segregated and as a consequence, opportunities that are available even in a next door neighborhood um, diffuse very slowly into these other sorts of these poor neighborhoods. And there's a citation to that. And what that means is that uh, this sort of inequality that comes from lack of access to opportunity is very persistent because it, uh, the diffusion of opportunities happens very slowly. And that's the sort of thing we see in the, the data about the fragile families and intergenerational mobility. And in fact, uh, this is again from the Harvard group. If you look at uh, the uh, interaction between neighborhoods, so how uh, easy is, how, how much do people actually visit other neighborhoods and you make a sort of a global measure for the city, you find that this uh, mixing of neighborhoods uh, fairly directly predicts uh, intergenerational mobility. So cities that have greater mixing of neighborhoods, the kids do better. If cities with less mixing of neighborhoods, the kids do worse. And as you can see, it's quite a strong relationship. Um, other data related to this is that, uh, uh, that is important is, okay, I want to have greater mixing in my neighborhoods. I want my kids exposed to other sorts of lifestyles to see that it's possible to do better. That's, that's what all of this data argues is the goal that you'd really like to have. Um, how do you do that? Well, what this graph shows is data that is, uh, uh, this happens to be from Europe, but we've done it on four continents. And what it says is, is that neighborhoods that have more diverse amenities, parks, stores, social services, have more diverse people. That's sort of dull, <laughs> you know, of course, but we forget that. 
uh, we tend to concentrate all of our amenities in one place. And so having a, a new and diverse neighborhood amenities, plus the ability to get there easily, uh, results in greater mixing of people, which results in people being able to see other lifestyles, role models, which results in the kids doing better and growing up better. That's the logic. Um, and uh, of course, that mixing predicts economic growth, uh, as you would expect. Uh, uh, if it really mixing allows you to harvest more opportunities, then mixing should predict economic growth. And it does very strongly. There's some uh, citations to that. This is a visual example. This is in Beijing. So there's diversity of mixing on the left. Uh, darker is more. And there's economic growth uh, on the right. And they're nearly the same. And this is a, a predictive capability controlling for investment, education, transportation, centrality, all the traditional things we think about it, just using diversity after all those controls, turns out to be an enormously powerful predictor of uh, long-term growth of a neighborhood. The thing that everybody does is says, well, gee, okay, we've got the internet, we'll just do more stuff online, right? And I think that you need to be extremely skeptical about that. Um, so here's something that appeared in the Royal Society a little while ago that we did. And uh, what, let me just explain what these things are. There's one here that's called shopping. So uh, the vertical axis is socioeconomic level, one through nine, zero through nine. So poor is uh, zero, nine is rich. Um, and then where they went shopping, was that neighborhood poor or rich? And what you see is you see that poor people shop in poor places, rich people shop in rich places, um, and they don't shop even in middle-class places. And this relationship holds even if you control for the price of the thing being bought. Poor people are just not comfortable in rich areas. Rich people are not comfortable in poor areas. And the same is true of mobility for entertainment, for work, other things, exactly the same thing. And that segregation of behavior comes across in their communication. When you look at social media, the poor people talk to the poor people, the rich people talk to the rich people. Yes, they could talk to everybody, but they don't. Um, so this is an example of looking at all the topics on Twitter. So uh, it's two sort of main axes of conversation. They're eigenvectors if you're interested. Um, but what it's showing is lower income people just talk to lower income people. Higher income people just talk to higher income people. <laughs> Middle class people talk, to, it's just, they live in separate worlds. Not only do they live in separate worlds physically, they live in separate worlds online, and that exactly mirrors the physical separation. So be a little skeptical when everybody says, well, we could make a website, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it never seems to work out. And finally, I just mentioned that I have a couple books that uh, uh, are addressing this way of thinking and giving you a lot of the sort of insights in this. And they're online and, and relatively inexpensive. And I'll just stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandy. So much resonates with us and it's reflected in some of the questions. Are you okay if we take some questions and, and Julian, um, likewise, if you don't mind putting your camera on? Um, yeah, so, I can be here another 15 minutes or so, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so the first question is, uh, we're seeing uh, the same effect here in the UK. Are big societal structural changes needed? Um, is what is needed possible given the political situation? Um, well, I can't of course speak for the political uh, possibilities, but um, there are things that can be done that will promote greater mixing. I think you know the first thing is, is just to realize that there is this enormous 
uh, behavioral segregation. So people don't feel comfortable in going in other sorts of neighborhoods. And infrastructure process uh, things like where do you build the road? Which roads do you make faster? Where do you put the park? Where do you, those are all biased towards rich areas um, and towards making the current situation more efficient. They ought to be biased towards making uh, uh, building equality of access of, of perhaps even more than equality. So the poor areas have greater access and they ought to be bias towards putting amenities into poor areas so that more diverse people visit there and create more opportunities and, and availability there. So there's a great deal that the public uh, uh, institutions can do without additional cost. It's really just simply being aware that you need to build that sort of equity of opportunity into your system at every stage. It's not additional money. It's just making sure that the less wealthy neighborhoods, the, the segregated neighborhoods have a, a, a naturally a, a mixing with the rest of society. Thank you, Julian. I know you're working with schools and something that you're passionate about. Um, did you want to um, add to that? Yeah. And thanks, Sandy, for a brilliant presentation. I really enjoyed that and lots of the things apply in the in the UK. If I was to give a, an example around university admissions, you're saying that you know, we, we get applications from many different social backgrounds and um, like what you talk about in the US where you construct a class like the top Ivy League institutions in the US will think really carefully and actually put considerable amounts of resources into creating a diverse class as a product of excellence rather than as something that's an issue of equity. So that diversity can get you great academic outcomes. And I think it's a really interesting philosophy. There's a difference between the US and the UK actually where diversity, I think the tradition in the US is, is, is been seen as a strength for far longer than in the UK. I think we're coming around to that now. But what's really interesting when you look at um, admissions in the UK, and I know you've got some universities doing this in the US as well, um, Sandy, is that um, you can look at all sorts of other data, of course, contextually about um, the types of people that you can bring in for, from a study group perspective. So we can look at people with similar levels of academic ability, but they could be from some of the very disadvantaged backgrounds that Sandy's talked about. And like for like, we have the data now where on a kind of a tie break decision, if you like, we can say, well, yeah, you know, if you've got two A grades and a B, you know, really good A-level scores, and you've come from a, an inner city area where from a family where nobody's been to university, a postcode area where very few people, well, we know there's levels of poverty, for example, we will take you over another applicant <clears throat> and not necessarily because we think uh, we feel sorry for you or an act of charity in the name of excellence we would take that student because we've got the data that shows like for like those sorts of students do better at our university as well so some of these issues of equity and equality they're different although you can you have to be yeah. careful and you have to sort of think about your political moral sort of traditions in your country and context is key i mean i'm always fascinated right. by the difference in the UK with an obsession on class and the US with a focus on race and diversity more. And, and you have to both challenge that, but also work with the grain of your society. Yeah, one of the things, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right about what you just said, and that's great to hear. One of the things we've done is study social networks in universities. Mm. And uh, even with a diverse class, you find uh, one of the most stratified uh, places in the, in the whole society is universities yeah. because the high status people or you know, people of one sort of category uh, will almost universally hang out with people that are like them. And it's also true with respect to uh, academic performance. High performers hang with high performers, low performers with low performers. Um, and a little bit discouragingly um, uh, attempts to just sort of mix the two, right? Like in in living quarters or other things have uh, have ended up very negatively. I mean, very negatively. Uh, so it's not quite clear how to, you can admit these people, but you have to, in some sense, um, allow for uh, some sort of situations that that uh, mix and the best experiments we've seen are ones uh, where 
there's a real emphasis on making sure that everybody feels like they're a part of the community uh, and uh, are supported in a very sort of personal and direct way, which pushes directly against the sort of economics of it, because actually touching people, talking to people, spending time with people costs money and administrators look at that and say, well, you know, why are you doing that? And this other university isn't, right? Uh, and the answer is, is we want our kids to succeed. <laughs> but, but it turns out that's a difficult argument with administrators. Thank you so much. And I, I'm going to invite a great friend of ours, Professor Norma Rains, to see if the technology will allow her to, to say her question. Norma, are you able to unmute and ask your question? Is that right now? Yes, that's we right. can hear you. <laughs> right. So um, thank you very much. That's really kind. And it was a brilliant presentation, kind of music to my heart, I have to say, and lovely to hear about it. So I've been running an intergenerational program, which is neighborhood and school based now for 20 years. And you just said something that's come out of this work. We still need more evaluations. Everybody feels like they're part of the community and that community has been the school. It's heated and lighted, and we've just brought local older people into schools to do what the schools need. The schools tell us, the schools drive it, etc. So I was just, uh, my question was, can you remind me, please, Aparna? It was, do you think that this kind of one-to-one -one role modeling that goes on uh, in, intergenerationally in, you know, in a community setting um, is, could be of any use at all in breaking down this dreadfully strong, obviously very potent set of social behaviours. Uh, because we've had people from all sorts, you've been able to demonstrate this, all sorts of social backgrounds, not just your middle class, etc. Yeah. coming into schools. I, I mean, uh, I, the, my answer is yes, I think that works. Um, it obviously has to be done uh, with some care. I mean, I can give you my hypothesis about how it works. And this is a partially social, you know, personal reflection, which is, you know, a kid needs to see this role model as somebody that they could become. They need to say, that person is like me, right? Except older, I could do that. And look, that's cool. And, and I'm gonna copy them. I'm gonna copy their swagger, their attitude, their modesty, whatever. Uh, uh, as a way of doing it. And, and in, uh, in America, at least in really poor neighborhoods, the only people that uh, a very young child uh, can copy are the drug dealers. Or the pimps or, you know, because they're the ones with the fancy cars and dress and they have the money. And uh, the five-year-old doesn't see that they, uh, they end up dead by the time they're 30. You know, but, um, you, you know, it... Uh, yeah, so, so constructing role models that the kids can identify with, I think is really uh, a fantastic thing to do. I'll just say something on that as well. It's a really good question, Norma, in terms of some university initiatives we have as well, where we use our own students as positive role models in local communities. And we do some amazing work in this. And um, what we've learned over the years, and we've, we've done a randomized control trial on this now, um, what we've learned over the years is who we put out as our university students is really important and it's not to say that we wouldn't let our more privileged students go out and be role models but it has more impact if that what you said there sandy you know, i can be like them but also that level of i think we we do a disservice to young people if we make that gap so big that they can't imagine making that yeah. <laughs> and so i think it's about somebody who's got a, a very um who's further ahead than them, but that they maybe have a similar accent. They um, they can imagine themselves doing it. And we found when we use local students who we use almost exclusively on a, a program called the Manchester Access Program, by which we've got hundreds of doctors across Greater Manchester come through this program, all first generation. It's one of the proudest programs I've ever introduced in my career. And um, it's, it's an amazing program. And what makes a difference is those people from you know a background in Oldham with the same accent saying, look, I'm training to be a doctor, I am a doctor, you can do it as well. I was once like you, and that's so powerful. And we've had this other initiative during the pandemic. We've had this partnership for 10 years now with a, 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 a charity in Manchester called the Tutor Trust, and they're so successful. 
they've expanded to Liverpool and Leeds as well. And I've been involved with them since the outset. And they've had a randomized control trial done showing that when we train up um, our students to go into schools to do small group and one-to-one -one tutoring with pupils on free school meals, so some of the most disadvantaged students in our city, that has a demonstrable measurable impact you know, it's statistically significant and it's the only tutor program in the UK that's got a randomized controlled trial so it's a world leading piece of evidence for impact and again what that's done is flip the model in in Britain um, I live close to a place called Trafford where you have to pass uh, an exam at 11 plus exam to get into the schools and I'm very anti that personally and but lots of other parents are happy to do that and I think um, that clearly middle class parents can pay for a lot of additional tuition. The school is free to go to. But I think that can't be right that out of our taxes, we're funding schools like this for a small section of society. And I think um, that the tutoring system is used in so many ways, which reinforce and actually create more of an equity barrier and reduces social mobility. So what this program does is it inverts that model and provides that high quality tutoring for free to the students who would benefit the most. And I think that's what we need to ask ourselves as social policies, because for too long, we've introduced well-meaning social policies to help everyone, which have actually increased the equity gap because yeah. middle-class parents with more cultural and social capital have been able to access those things. So that's the trick, I think. We have to get better at saying no to some people benefiting from things. So we're quite used to saying, I'm gonna have to say no loads to very middle-class parents saying, can my child get on the Manchester Access Programme? It's like, no, it's not for you. You've got all of those things at home, your child has, you should relax a bit, be confident. These other kids haven't, and those are the people we have to invest in if we're gonna try and change yeah. status. So one, one thing that we did, in, and this was in Bangladesh, is we set up a tutoring service. So what this would be, would be, um, you know, like, uh, I'm gonna use the American system, 11th grader, so someone in high school, um, tutoring someone who is uh, four or five, six years younger in the same neighborhood. And it's an important source of income for the high school student, right? Because, you know, they come from very poor families. So, you know, making, making a, a, a few rupees or whatever it is in Bangladesh, I'm sorry, uh, you know, really, really matters for them. But you get to see um, the, the, the kid that's much younger gets to see someone like them from their neighborhood who's doing good um, and is only a couple of years older, so that it's very clearly something you can aspire to, right? That's, that's so fantastic and such a great way. Uh, I can tell you I've got more and more questions for you both, uh, but we've run out of time and uh, just wanted to say a huge thanks to Sandy and Julian. It sounds like uh, there's some great synergies and... Um, Sandy, I think we'll be coming to you to, to learn more about the fantastic work you presented. Yeah, I look, look forward to it. Take care. Uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you, Julian, for all your help as well in your kind words. Thank you to our attendees. Um, Plenary 3, I've put the Zoom link in. Starts in one minute. Thank you so much.